Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Arma Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is, is it June 2nd? Is that right, Gerardo? Yes. All right. It's June 2nd, 2022, and we are super excited to be continuing our series with Dr. Simon Southerton. He's former Mormon bishop and geneticist, and he has been uh, so gracious to uh, to be willing to participate in a multi-episode series on Mormon doctrine versus science. We've covered, you know, uh, Adam and Eve. We've covered uh, creation, Noah and the flood. We've covered so many important topics. And today is not going to disappoint. Today we are going to be talking about Mormon cosmology, uh, again, with Dr. Simon Southerton. And we have with us, of course, uh, riding shotgun, Dr. Gerardo Sumano. No? <laughs> not, not a uh, we'll see. Yeah, thanks we'll for see one day. Thanks for joining us, Gerardo, and thanks for helping produce this. Yeah, no problem. It's great to have you. Yeah. All right. And without any further ado, let's bring on uh our our additional co-host, Dr. Simon Southerton, along with a few special guests. So Simon, welcome back to Mormon Stories and welcome back to your series. Thank you, John. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very excited about today's episode. We've we've got uh, I've brought in two scientists to support me today. Um, outstanding. We've got some outstanding guests um, who are joining us. Um, first of all, Bill White. Welcome, um, Bill. Thank you. And, Glad to be here. And John, and John Perry from here. the website Stated Clearly. That's, I'm very excited to have them both here, both of you with us. Um, I wanted just to give you a bit of background on our two guests today. First of all, Bill is uh, Emer Emeritus uh, Professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at uh, Cornell University. And just this year, he was given a very prestigious award by the European Association of Geochemistry. It's the H.C. Urey Award. And they wrote a citation about Bill, which I think is an outstanding citation. I just wanted to read that out to give you an idea of, of um, uh, how outstanding he is as a scientist. So Bill White is a pioneer who shaped our understanding of chemical geodynamics of the deep earth. He's made several fundamental contributions in many areas of geochemistry, but especially to our understanding of geochemical architecture of the mantle. The nature of crustal recycling in the mantle and the evolution of the mantle crust system. Bill White is well known for authoring the two most widely used textbooks on geochemistry and isotope geochemistry. Through the generous sharing of his ideas, his influence goes far beyond his public publications and permeates all of geochemistry and earth science. So it's fair to say that we've got an absolutely outstanding guest. Bill's Welcome. It's really great. It's wonderful to have you here, and thanks for your time. Um, our next guest is John Perry. Um, actually started out studying biology and illustration at BYU, but he was so um, – some of the work that he'd done was so outstanding that it was he, he was headhunted for a startup. So he left BYU, um, and John is a, a science educator and he's the founder of Stated Clearly. It's a website and YouTube channel that produces animations. And we saw one of these animations earlier on in our podcast series on mm. um, uh, evolution. And it was um, amazing. And we're going to be showing one of John's uh, animations today. But these animations have been viewed, viewed by millions of people around the world. Um, and they're used a lot in classrooms and museums. So. Um, so he, he began this project in uh, 2012. I, I, I guess that was about the time you left BYU. Would, yeah, would uh, you yeah, right? as a little bit after. Yeah, a couple of years after. And uh, and you can go to his website and you can see that it's called "What Is DNA and How Does It Work?" and it's it is the best and most interesting description oh, of thanks. some really complicated material in science. Um, but it is beautiful, and and DNA is such a um, certainly a molecule that I'm quite attracted to, and uh, it's been very important in my life. Um, but, uh, yeah, John's an outstanding communicator. and uh, with, uh, I, both I knew about that, those uh, animations back in the days when I was teaching about RNA world. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's just the, it's brilliant the way extremely complicated things are, 
are very accurately described in such an entertaining way that pretty much anybody that's got any interest will be able to follow. Um, and that's, I think that's, that's beautiful. And I think it's John's work and the work of um, communicators like him is going to have a huge impact over the next few decades to bring, to sort of break down these sort of barriers that, ex that have existed between academia and the, the general population. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, it's great to have two very, I mean, we're very different. I mean, uh, Bill's had an outstanding career. Um, you know, very prestigious university and done outstanding science. I've actually dug into his uh, academic record. He's got a, a whole bunch of nature papers. And these are very difficult to get papers into nature. Um, he's got a paper entitled The Origin of Samoa. We might talk a bit about how Samoa came into existence later in the podcast. Um, but we're also going to talk about black holes. Um, just this year, they've discovered the black hole that exists in the Milky Way, our own galaxy. Um, and it's just phenomenal and uh, the, the sort of stuff that science is uncovering. So we'll talk about black holes. We're going to talk about um, some of the theories of how life emerged on the Earth. Um, but before we do that, we're going to dive straight into the doctrine. Okay, so we're going to spend a few minutes just talking about LDS doctrine that's related to um, events that took place before, leading up to the formation of the earth. So basically um, uh, the science before, right up into the point until life emerged. And then what, what are some of the, uh, the things that scientists have learned that suggest how life may have emerged on the earth and then some of the signs of the earliest life on the earth. So, Simon, I'm I'm dying to ask Bill whether there's any chance the Earth's core is made of water, but I'm going to hold off. Oh man, you're diving straight in, John. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, Bill, what are, you, yeah. what are the odds the Earth's core is made of water? Zero. Um, is, that in the, is that in your presentation, Simon? You want um, to if, one, if you've read the show notes, obviously, yeah, we're going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, Bill's an absolute. Uh, world leader on what the, the the core and the mantle of the earth and the crust are made of and uh yeah well i don't want to steal your thunder simon but bill I, <laughs> you're not no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it you're not getting away until you answer that question bill <laughs> well, i'm happy to tell you why but let me tell you it's zero chance <laughs> <laughs> okay absolutely right, we can end we can um, end just get the, yeah we'd be sitting on a bomb i would imagine <laughs> Yeah. All right, all so right. So let's just dive into the science. And we were chatting before we went live about what's on the LDS website. And if you, if you move to that, um, the first slide, if, when you go onto the LDS website, all of the uh, science articles are written by non scientists. Um, I've got two examples on this first slide. And uh, John, I might get you to, uh, John Delin, I might get you to read the first one there. And it's uh, it's an article by uh, F. Kent Nielsen. Um, Absolutely. Written back, in, re written back in 1980. So this is science from the, the LDS Church's website. Yeah, the, the article is called the, the Gospel. Website. It's called The Gospel and the Scientific View. Yeah. And the Mormon Church quotes Kent Nielsen, F. Kent Nielsen, saying, God, quote, has the power to perform miracles to make what appears to us to be temporary exceptions to the order of nature as we understand it, if it is his will to do so. Yeah. Yeah? And a similar sentiment, if you go on, perhaps, John, read the other one, because they're sort of a similar sort of an argument. So this is from the article, The Flood in the Tower of Babel. This is Donald Perry, quote, because modern scientists observe geologic change to be relatively slow now, many have naturally concluded that geological processes have always been slow. Yet uniformitarianism, a premise on which much of geologic science is based, is an idea, not a fact. All right. So what does that mean and why is that relevant? Well, this, this is... This is what the current generation of Mormons are seeing on the LDS website. 
So the yeah, it's it's there's nothing on the LS website that the general membership is seeing that conflicts with young earth creationism. So it's basically Christian fundamentalism, and that's pretty much probably what you would have been exposed to, Bill, as a, a, a young member in the church. So it's pretty much anti-evolution, um, and they interpret the uh, the Bible literally. So the earth is six or 7,000 years old. There was a global flood, Tower of Babel, all that sort of stuff. So so in order to, uh, to get around the, the challenges that scientists present they're trying to can they're basically given giving god free license to change the rules change things up so things that science tells us look like they took billions of years to take place can all be jammed within a few thousand years so you know, how do you speed up? Yeah, you might be able to move continents really, really quickly, but how do you change um, the rate of decay of isotopes, which tell us how old rocks are and that sort of thing? Um, so it's, yeah, it's a... Well, it's basically um, Orthodox Mormons don't like um, carbon carbon dating, and so they, you know, don't like the, the ages and the dating that carbon dating tells us. And so they want to say that God's ways are higher than our ways and God can speed things up or slow things down as he needs to, to make it so Orthodox yeah. Mormon doctrine is still true, basically. Yeah. Get out of free jail. Get it on yeah. jail free card. Right, they, right, right. They gave yeah. themselves. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Right. But I should right. point out that um, everything that we've God. discussed. Pretty perverse God. That yeah. came the foolish and to think that geologic time was and, and the decay of isotopes was uh, was could change i, I just that's, i think that's perverse i would agree um and there are geologists and life scientists at byu right now bill that agree with you entirely um so this is the double think that's going on in the church right now um there are geologists all of the the most respected scientists at BYU um, pretty much accept all of the science that we're talking about. Okay. So there, there's just a complete disconnect between the church's university, which is headed by the prophet, and the uh, and uh, what the, the the brethren and the and the leaders are publishing on the the church's current website. So. So, yeah, that's the sort of disconnect that I wanted to point out right in the beginning. But let's just, just dive straight into some of the um, the doctrine that the church has related to the to um, the earth, uh, our solar system and the universe. So the, um, the earth is um, from the Doctrine and Covenant 77, verse 6. This is where Joseph Smith held a question and answer session with um, basically with God. And he'd been reading Revelations. And he had a question. So his question was, what are we to understand by the book which John saw, which was sealed on the back with seven seals? And this is the answer from God. We are to understand that it contains the revealed will, mysteries and the works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the 7,000 years of its continuance or its temporal existence. Um, and so many Mormons believe as a result of that, that the earth is 7,000 years old. Um, also, uh, the teachings in the Bible um, concerning the creation of the earth are repeated in the book of Moses, so in, in LDS scripture, and it confirms um, the, that the events in, in, that took place during the creation of the earth. And I'm actually amazed that I had not noticed this in all my life in the church, but the earth and the planets were created on day three, the sun and the moon were created on day four. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the problem there, which I had never noticed. I, I just can't believe that I was in the church for so long and I didn't notice this problem. So the sun didn't exist before <laughs> plants were created. So huh. anyway, <laughs> it's funny what you learn when you sort of start, you know, really take this scriptures. Yeah. When you actually, yeah. read the, it's it's amazing what you learn when you actually read the scriptures, right? And pay yeah. attention yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
what were the plants surviving on? I don't know. Yeah. Could we also contradict with Genesis? I mean, I think, you know, the first thing is let there be light. You assume that's the sun and the stars, right? Yeah, they, it, it does actually say let there be light on day one, I think. Yeah. Um, but the fact that the sun is created after. After the um, light? It's just, it's, yeah, it's really puzzling. I mean, God is the, so maybe God was just standing there shining and that's how the plants got their, you know, got yeah. the sun that they needed to do photosynthesis was just yeah. God just kind of stood there and was their light source. Maybe. Oh, or Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> maybe God sent Jesus to be the light source for the plants. Is that yeah. possible? Probably what Mormons yeah. believe. Yeah. Okay. So All another right. interesting little doctrine there that the earth revolves around the sun. This is really, this is actually revealed in Helaman, the Book of Mormon. And it's just sort of a throwaway line where he says, for surely it's the earth that moves around, that moveth and not the sun. Um, so this is uh, this is actually Nephi, a prophet Nephi, not the first Nephi, but an, an, a subsequent Nephi um, that made this statement. Um, so he's basically 1,500 years before Copernicus, um, really, uh, when everyone removed, felt that the uh, the sun revolved around us. Um so I think that Joseph Smith might have been uh, leaning on some of the science that he was aware of at the time. Mm. So we shift on to the next slide. There's a f few other sort of uh, cosmological doctrines that... Um, can, can, Simon, can I, just, can I just what, really quickly just share one quick thing? And I'm not going to, you know, shame anybody or punch down, but there's a comment that just came in uh that i just want to share really quickly sure. he basically he basically says i come in from lunch sit down and immediately what i get is this anti-mormon crap that was the comment that one of our viewers or listeners made and yeah. i just i just want to say that this is just science and it's mormon scripture there, I don't think science is anti-Mormon. I don't think the church would claim science is anti-Mormon. And I don't think the Mormon church would call its own scriptures anti-Mormon. And that's literally, we haven't shared yeah, it. Right? So far? We're yeah. fairly strict. In the first section, when we talk about the doctrine, we're talking, we quote heavily from scripture. Yeah, this is Randy Jordan. And we, and we are quoting from the LDS website. Yeah. I don't, I'm not interested in quoting Mormon doctrine which has now been the church distances itself from Mormon doctrine. But um, I took, we focusing on the doctrine. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. So there are some other interesting, yeah, there are other interesting doctrines that the, the church has. Um, and we might just skip, we'll, we'll skip through these fairly quickly. There's worlds without number. Um, and there's a scripture in, um, in Moses there. It actually uh, refers to worlds in Hebrew um, so worlds, as in there's, there are additional worlds to this one, is is hinted at in, in Hebrew, um, in Hebrews in the Bible, but in the in Moses it refers to millions of earths like this that have been created, um, and many have been destroyed. So there's this Mormon the Mormons believe that they're um, they're being created and they pass away. Uh, it refers describes God's residence. Um, he resides on a, uh, a globe like a sea of glass and fire. Um, another um, doctrine that I've discovered is that, um, that, and I think we're probably all familiar with this, that Mormons believe that matter is eternal. So um, in the Doctrine and Covenants it says, for man is spirit, the elements are eternal, and spirit and element inseparably connected to receive a fullness of joy. So there's some additional doctrines that the uh, um, that are fairly widely believed in the church, and there's some good references for those there. Now, some of those aren't so bad, right? That there are worlds with that end that would that would be supported by this idea that there are infinite universes. So that's that's a hit, right? And also, I, um, yeah, I think that's probably a hit. And then also that matter is eternal. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, because matter um, is created nor destroyed, right? Yeah, I Bob? think there were quite a few. Certainly, scientists by that time had a pretty good idea that uh, matter couldn't be uh, destroyed. Was Bob uh, so Bob going to say something? He may have borrowed that idea, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, Bill. Sorry, Bill. Were you going to say something, Bill? 
Well, it does turn out that you can turn matter into energy and energy into matter. Uh, that wasn't known in the 19th century, but the, some of the two do seem to be conserved. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I suppose another hit you hey. can give to the theology is that God's goal seems to be reproduction, right? In Mormon theology, he's making more gods, which puts him square in there in the, um, that's what all biological life forms are doing. So maybe that yeah. maybe that's something you could consider to be a hit. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. Well, we're willing to acknowledge hits when, when, when the church gets them, right? Right, Gerardo? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Bullseyes. Right. Good job, Joseph Smith. Nice <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah. So um, if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about Colob. So um, if you've been to the Book of Mormon musical, and there's a slight correction that uh, God doesn't actually live on Colob. It's the nearest star to God's residence. Um, it's also a, uh, and, and all of the doctrine related to Kolob comes from the Book of Abraham. In fact, most of Mormon cosmological uh, theology sort of stems from uh, the, the Book of Abraham in, in particular, um, and also the, uh, the facts, uh, facsimile too in the Book of Abraham. So Kolob is a governing star that's um, close to where God resides. And it governs the earth and similar planets. And the sun borrows its light from Kolob through the medium of K. Van Rash. I, um, so I don't know what that is, but that's um, that's how it's uh, spelt out in the, the book of Abraham. Sounds fancy. Yeah. It's not a um, genuine kind of thing. <laughs> so there's a, the reckoning. Uh, so according to Abraham, one day... A revolution of Kolob is equivalent to 1,000 years on Earth. So, effectively, one. Um, yeah, so one year at Kolob would be equivalent to about roughly 365,000 years on Earth. Um, and this particular part of Abraham, I found it very, very confusing because it talks about set time and the time of reckoning and this goes on for quite a few verses in this chapter and I, I i just couldn't really figure out what it was all saying and uh i couldn't really find any sort of apologetics that really made an, an awful lot of sense from it and it's it's not talked about very much in the church so i don't know exactly what those things mean um, really really quickly simon um can you, most Mormons aren't going to know what the word cosmology means. Can you just define what the word cosmology means? And then I have a, a follow-up observation. Uh, we've got an expert. Bill, Bill, you can perhaps <laughs> define. Basically, it's sort of a, astronomy, I guess. Uh, I would say cosmology is a study of how the entire universe has evolved. Yeah. Oh, and, and how we've gone from... Uh, a singularity through uh, multiple galaxies. So it's somewhat, you know, uh, it, it's astronomy at a very, very large scale is the way I'd express it, you know, and, and incorporating everything you know about physics, okay, and yeah. trying to understand the way the universe is based on what we know about physics yeah. uh, into some sort of uh, grand uh, theory. Mm. And I think it's, you know, it's fair to say that Joseph Smith really did, um, he was trying to grapple with these sorts of things uh, when he had these revelations or um, was inspired, you know, by the facsimiles. And we're going to talk about a facsimile in a minute. But um, so he was trying to get a sense of what's out there, this grand picture and, and put it into doctrine to, to make sense of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, can I ask Bill a quick question, Simon? Sure. So, Bill, what does it mean? So, one, what would it mean that that uh, sort of an uneducated farm boy in the 1830s is naming the existence of a planet that happens to be God's residence? I'm not trying to be sarcastic, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I do, well, let's just take Joseph Smith seriously for a second. 
here's a here's a uneducated you know uh you know 20 something in the 1830s claiming that he's identified a planet called Kolob that is the nearest i don't know star to god's residence and that it's a thousand times bigger um than the earth and that one day on Kolob is a thousand years on earth is there anything that you can observe or analyze from those sorts of claims uh I'm not asking you to kind of validate it or even disprove it, but do you have any scientific observations about those claims? No, uh, not really, but a thousand times the size of the earth is still probably not big enough to be a star. Wow. That's interesting. Because <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you how many times bigger is the so, uh, sun than the earth, but I didn't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So the, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I forget, but the, the sun is more than a thousand times larger than, than the, uh, than yeah, the Earth it's massive. star. You've got to have a lot of mass to make a star. Um, you know, I just say, I mean, a, a Christian in most theologies thinks that heaven is somewhere up there. He was trying to put, be specific. I, I, you know, it's not, I don't think there's, a any sort of specific scientific basis for, for that, but it's somehow consistent broadly with uh, lots of uh, religious theologies. Right. How about, Bill, I, I have another question. How about the idea that uh, one day on earth can be, or a thousand years on earth can count for 24 hours in another planet? Yeah, do do stars do stars rotate around an axis like the Earth would? Uh, absolutely, they rotate around their own axis. Absolutely, and uh, uh, well, you <laughs> uh, Mercury doesn't rotate at all, okay, because it's it's in tidal lock with the with the sun. So planets rotate at very different rates, and they orbit stars at very different rates. So a day on any particular planet is not a day on another planet. That Mars is, uh, you know, the day is about an hour longer than our Earth. Um, also, the Earth is the Moon's in tidal uh, lock with the uh, with with the Earth. Uh, one side's always facing the Earth. Um, so that basically that means it's it's day. It does in fact rotate such that it's always facing the Earth. So its day is about a month long. Um, yeah, sure. Um, every planet's going to have a different length of a day. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. But it's hard to comprehend how the Earth would be revolving around something that's way outside of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Or that our sun is rotating again around something outside, outside of our solar system. Well, well outside. Yeah, I mean, the, the sun itself is orbits around the center of the galaxy. Okay, yeah. stars, not only do planets orbit around the sun, but stars orbit around the, the galactic center. And, uh, yeah. and groups of galaxies in, gravitationally influence each other. Now, I'm not quite oh. sure what degree they rotate around. I'm, I'm sure there's probably examples that they do. Uh, but we, we live in what's called a local group of galaxies, and they gravitationally influence each other. So yeah. gravity governs all these motions. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I'd, I'd give that a, a little bit of a hit as well. Yeah. And with his doctrine. All right, let's just move on to... Uh, but it's not original to Book of Abraham because it's mentioned on the Bible. The rotational period of the sun around the galaxy is something like Oh, I think it's a hundred thousand years, but I might hundred thousand years or is a hundred million. I can't remember, but it's very long. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay, I want to just spend a bit, of, a little bit of time talking about the facsimiles. Um, now, facsimile two doesn't get an awful lot of attention, um, and on this slide we've got facsimile two from the Book of Abraham. So this is a uh, claims to be a, an image originally produced 2000, in 2000 BC. Um, and I've highlighted some of the uh, parts of this facsimile that Joseph Smith in the accompanying text 
Um, so in chapter three, and also in the uh, in the uh, footnotes for the for this um, particular facsimile, I've highlighted some of the images that Joseph Smith identifies um, that are relevant to our discussion. First of all, is God on His throne in the upper right hand side of the uh, hypocephalus? So this is a I should say up front. This is a hypocephalus. This is a a a sort of a fabric disc that has this image written, um, drawn on it, that is placed under the head of the deceased. So hypo meaning under and cephalus head. So this is placed on, under the head of the deceased. And there's several hundred of these that have been um, recovered. And so they're, they're inside the mummy. And um, so Joseph Smith um, obtained, when he purchased the uh, the Egyptian the mummy and the papyri uh, also purchased a, a hypocephalus. And so this, in this image, you can see there's God in, sitting in his throne. Um, there are two stars that are receiving light from Kolob. You've got Kolob in the center. And then below it, you've got the sun receiving light from Kolob. And then um, there's the earth with its four quarters. Well, I did a bit of Googling <laughs> and... Gerardo, if you click the mouse again, the other side of the slide will open up and show you another hypocephalus. Yeah. And you can do this yourself. You can go online and look for other hypocephali, I guess that's what you call a plural, and you can see all of this, virtually all of the same elements that are in facsimile 2 appearing in hypocephalus that have been, that are dated to between uh, three and four hundred years bc so in this one you can see in the top hand side you can see all of the elements that i've highlighted in the facsimile two from the book of abraham also appear in this um, hypocephalus that appears in the british museum and i won't attempt to pronounce that guy's name and this is what the real translation of these uh, components are so you've got the top right hand side is the sun god ra then you've, in this element, you've got, um, in the British Museum, hypocephalus, you've got baboons, four baboons that are adoring Ra, and it's the god Amun-Ra in the centre that, that the baboons are adoring. Um, below Amun-Ra, you've got the Hatha cow, and then to the left of the Hatha cow, you've got the four sons of Horus. Now, these are the canopic jars. And these actually appear in another one of the facsimiles in much larger detail. And the canopic gar, um, jars, they carry the, they carry the, um, the lungs, the liver, the stomach, and the intestines of the person who's been buried. In this particular, um, in facsimile two, Joseph Smith interprets those as being the four quarters of the earth. In the other facsimile, I think it's facsimile one, but I could be wrong. Yeah, one. Um, there, the uh, the four jars are interpreted as different idolatrous gods. Um, so there's actually a, the same image in both of the facsimiles is interpreted differently. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the real translation on the right, um, and I was I was just really fascinated. So I I decided to have just a little bit of a closer look at some of the elements in this. So if we go to the next slide, um, we have a text that accompanies the um, facsimile, and I've highlighted, I've expanded the uh, the Hatha cow and the baboons that are adoring Ra. And then in, in the text accompanying these the facsimile, it says that the um, Hatha cow is the Egyptians, is, is the sun, and it borrows its lights, its light from Kolob through this medium of K Van Rash. <clears throat> and in the lower side there, the stars. So the baboons are represented uh, by numbers 22 and 23. Uh, and they're receiving light. So they're stars and they're receiving light from the revelation revolutions of Kolob. So it's just really interesting how Joseph is seeing these images and interpreting these images in this way. <laughs> Excuse me. 
So I did a little bit of digging and I the, into why baboons, I was quite interested in why baboons appear in the facsimiles. And it turns out that the, um, if you move on to the next slide, is the Egyptians worship baboons because they were an, an exotic animal. Baboons don't naturally occur near Luxor, where the uh, um, where the Egyptian, the, the major Egyptian uh, civilization occurred, and where most of the uh, Egyptian mummies are found. And the reason that they worship the baboons is they, I mean, they're just such a striking animal. Um, you can see the the male Hamadryas baboon there on the right. Um, and that's the species of baboon that the uh, Egyptians used to worship. And one of the reasons they used to worship them was because baboons are well known for sitting upright and watching the rising sun. So they warm themselves very early in the morning sun. So in some ways they look like they're sort of a worshipping, they're worshipping the, the sun god Ra. Uh, and that's probably why they sort of began to deify them. In fact, they worshipped them for about 3,000 years. Um, there are images of baboons in the Egyptian um, in the Egyptian ruins. So, but scientists have even and one sorry they've even f discovered why the baboons do that. And one of the reasons is these this species of baboon eats a lot of grass. So it's got a lot of it's almost like a um, a cow in that it eats a lot of grass, and and in order to digest that. Mm. Um, it needs the bacteria in its body to multiply. And by warming up in the morning, that helps to the bacteria in their stomachs to, to, to multiply so they can digest the plants better. Um, it's really fascinating. But scientists have also been able to, uh, can, in this image, you can see a, a mummified uh, baboon and they extracted uh, strontium from the teeth of these baboons, baboons and Bill will, will know all about this sort of science. And he was they were able to determine roughly where that baboon came from because the strontium in the teeth reflects the isotope ratios in the soil where that baboon was um, basically born or where it grew up in its early in its life whereas the bones reflect the strontium levels in the surrounding area where the baboon lived most, most of its life. So they were able to determine that this baboon came from about probably about 1,300 kilometres away down on the, at the end of the Red, at the, the bottom of the Red Sea. So even sort of 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians um, were trading extensively all the way along the Red Sea and they brought this baboon back. Um, and that's sort of how they got into the uh, facsimiles, um, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah, certainly. And so if I, if I were to summarize, uh, at least part of what you're saying is, is that Joseph mm -hmm. Smith got these papyrus, um, saw these facsimiles and took a lot of... Uh, interpreted a lot of Egyptian symbols that we now know exactly what they mean and they have to do with with Egyptian deity, with, with with Egyptian funerary texts, you know, baboons, um, yeah. symbolism, symbolism and symbology around death and 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 Egyptian religious worship, etc. And basically he interpreted it to be a bunch of um celestial objects or beings or planetary yeah. phenomena that had has no basis in reality is that what you're saying well yeah it's it's just hard to imagine you know over such a long period of time i mean the egyptians have been worshiping the moon for three thousand years right um it, the hypercephaluses were of start i think they weren't they weren't produced over that length of time but there was a certainly it was a. It wasn't in Abraham's time when hypercephaluses were being produced, mm -hmm. but they worshipped him. And and clearly, yes, he's 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 imagining this uh, cos cosmology, and uh, you know, uh, perhaps Mormons would argue that he's inspired by it 
to to by these images to come up with this cosmology but um but yeah our, our listener was very uh, critical of us and and calling us anti-mormons well we move on to the next slide it's it's um, we're not alone there are some very LDS scholars who would fall into the same category as as us um and I think there's there's really is quite a push now amongst scholars, earlier scholars, to distance themselves from the facsimiles because the facsimiles are clearly not. Um, he just has anything that Joseph Smith identifies in the facsimiles is always incorrect. Um, so there's a number of very powerful quotes here from you know Royal Scows and Terrell Givens, Brian Howglid, all of these. Um, um, perhaps, I mean, John or Harado, do you want to do you want to read some sure. of those out? Yeah, this one is from Royal Skousen, and this I think came from an email. Yeah, it says email, yeah. uh, and where he Royal Skousen is a retired BYU professor, but, uh, and he said, "I definitely do not hold a positive view of Joseph Smith's interpretation of the facsimiles." The facsimiles are shameful reproductions and have been so from. <laughs> the 140s when first published in the times and seasons 1840s yeah 1840s yeah yep. so basically denouncing the facsimiles uh turtle given said in the case of the facsimiles smith was apparently wrong and in the case of the book of abraham narrative he may have been as well and yeah. this was 2019 on their book on his book with that he wrote with brian Hauglick on the pearl of great price uh the pearl of greatest price and then in yeah. 2018 we have brian hoglet a retired byu professor saying i no longer agree with gee or mulestein uh, and for people who don't know gee and mulestein are both byu professors who try to save joseph's translations of the facsimiles so how <laughs> is saying he doesn't agree with them anymore and find their apologetic scholarship on the book of abraham abhorrent yeah, that's kind of three strikes and uh, very, and, very, very strong language from three highly regarded uh, scholars. Right, it says Brian three. Howglid, yeah, Brian Howglid's published books on the Book of Abraham uh, under the under the uh, BYU banner. Yeah, Brian was one of the leading Book of yeah. Abraham apologists for many, many years, but Terrell Givens is still at the Maxwell Institute. As probably yeah. the Mormon Church's number one apologist, he's saying he realizes the Book of Abraham is a, a false translation. Yeah. Uh, and Royal Skousen, he's been really important in in studying the Book of Mormon, the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon, and analyzing the Book of Mormon text. So these are heavyweight Mormon scholar apologists acknowledging that Joe. I've, I've heard Terrell Givens has recommended removing the Book of Abraham from the Mormon scriptural canon. I, that's how much, that's how little Terrell Givens' confidence he has in, in the book of Abraham. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway. Yeah. And a, a, a common theme is here is that these men retire. A couple of these have retired, so they're now safe. Um, to talk. Yeah. Yeah. And Terrell is now, Terrell's 65, and I think he's all safe now. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think we've probably spent a little bit more time than I wanted to on. I want to get into the science. So let's just dive. Get out. You broke up for a second, yeah, Simon. Doctrine. Okay, Simon, you broke up for a second. Can you repeat that? Yeah. So let's move into the science. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get back to some. This is where I, this is what I'm really most looking forward to is talking about science and hopefully today we're going to talk about some things that you know we're just not that are new to us and that we're um, really interesting. I'm absolutely sure with our guests that we're going to uh, um, to get into some new territory. But I thought I'd start with this Hubble ultra deep field image, which I think is just some of the most stunning stuff that's um, been photographed in the last just only in the last few years. Um, but I thought a good way to kick off would be, as I mentioned uh, to you earlier, I 
I put out a call for questions from um, post-Mormons in several of the Facebook groups, and I wanted to ask some questions from, uh, ask some of the questions that people proposed. So I'll ask this one to you, Bill. This is from Cody Stocks. How about laying out the evidence behind how we know there was a big bang? How do we know that the universe is expanding from a singular point? And what empirical evidence show that, shows that fact? Um, first of all, we start with the fact that it appears that uh, distant objects are receding away from us. So in that slide, you see these little red dots. Those are really, really distant galaxies. And the fact that they're red and not white means that they're receding away from us because the wavelengths of light are expanding. You know, it's the Doppler effect that you can, you know, you can tell a, a train whistle whether the train's approaching or, or, or uh, receding uh, because the, fre the frequency changes. And what's happening is the frequency is changing in those red spots because they're it receding from us. They're, they're, they're getting further and further away. And so this was the initial idea that the Earth, excuse me, the, the, the universe is somehow expanding. Um, and if you extrapolate back, you find that it all ends up in a singularity. So that was Hebel's work in maybe the 1930s, first introducing that idea of, of, uh, of an expanding universe. Um, since then, we've learned a lot of things. And uh, the high energy physics that people do in these accelerators like CERN, where they crash particles together with enormous energies, begins to tell us things that might have actually happened uh, when you crunch the universe down into this tiny little uh, uh, singularity, if you want. Yeah. It turns out... Um, that that works out pretty well with actually what we see. For example, you start out, you once you crystallize uh, matter from energy, what you start out producing is a whole lot of he, uh, hydrogen and helium and a wee tad of lithium and beryllium. And that's what we yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, 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 the, so the physics sort of works here. And, and I'll tell you something else. You know, the question is, how do we know that the, the universe is 13.8 billion years old? When I first started teaching at Cornell, I was teaching that, well, we don't really know. It's somewhere between 10 and 20 billion years. The, the 20 billion years came from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the apparent age of the oldest stars. And uh, the 10 billion years came from the Hubble constant, the rate at which things seem to be receding. Um, and then the, these different astronomers sort of came together and realize, you know, tweaked their their physics in each case, tweaked their observations, and coalesced around this number about thirty stars. Well, it's about that. How long does it take to bring the universe back into a singularity? Well, it's about that. The other thing we have is this cosmic background radiation, which was discovered when a couple of uh, of radio engineers or physicists from, I think I think it was Bell Labs, started pointing their radio antennas around different directions and always heard the same buzz. Well, it turns out this is the cosmic background radiation, which in fact was predicted by the Big Bang hypothesis. And what that was, it, it, the universe was so hot for the first roughly 400,000 years that electromagnetic radiation, light couldn't penetrate it through it um, be, because everything was ionized. And so light would just, you know, strike an ionized particle. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that also, if you figure out, so that is now radio waves, but it used to be light. And so if you figure out how long it would have taken, what's the, ra you know, how, how long would it have taken, how much expansion you have to, to do to get that uh, from light waves to uh, radio waves, well, that works out too. So we have a whole bunch of things that work out uh, that you put together that, that sort of work with this, uh, with this Big Bang hypothesis. 
And uh, mm. it's, it's a hypothesis. And the thing is that it explains a whole lot of things quite well. And nobody's figured out a better way to explain any, to explain those things better. That's the way it is in science. You yeah. take, you take this, the hypothesis that explains the most things in the most simplest way, and, and that's what you accept. And you're always willing to wait and see if somebody comes along with a better idea. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll maybe accept that. But in the last, you know, uh, nearly hundred years, nobody's come along with a better idea. Yeah. So, Bill, it's um, so it's not just one line of evidence that is pointing oh. to. It's, it's several lines of evidence. So I hadn't heard that one about the radio waves, the light sort of the wavelength changing. And, and the, they can tell from the rate of the change of that wavelength. They can extrapolate back to that time point. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Right. And, oh, okay. and, and, and this background was predicted by the theory before it was discovered. That's yeah. always a good sign for a theory that can pre actually predict new discoveries. Yeah. So it's fair to say then that this, the age of the universe is just sort of widely, very widely accepted in the scientific community amongst experts, people who know enough to, to appreciate the science. Yeah, there's not much debate about it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, there was a, a, a comment I saw this morning here too that, that asked me or asked, specifically about the question of uh, is the universe expanding at, at, a, at a speed greater than the speed of light? And the answer is no, not right now. If it were, we couldn't see anything. At least we couldn't see back to the uh, earliest yeah. universe. But, but in the very earliest universe, and this is where, you know, things get kind of interesting. That is, in the first 10 to the 32, 10 to the minus 32 seconds, okay, unimaginably short amount of time, uh, the universe went through something called inflation and did suddenly rapidly expand. Okay, and, and that's um, at, a, at a rate much, much greater than the speed of light. It was so yeah. early in the universe, there wasn't any matter anyway. And, and I'm not a cosmologist, I'm a geochemist. So, so the Big Bang Theory gets only interesting once you start making matter, uh, from my perspective. And that's way before there was any matter. Matter only yeah. comes along after uh, a microsecond into the history of the uh, universe, which is for, for these cosmo. Uh, Cosmophysicists, that's a long time because a lot of things were happening before the first yeah. microscope. So I've, Thank you, I've done a little, in my reading, I could find that there are some people that believe the big, the big Bang was the beginning of, and there was nothing before the Big Bang. Do, do you, what's your sense, Bill? Is it, is, are there, could there be more Big Bangs that are going to take place? Or uh, you were, know, were there potentially Big Bangs before this one? Or? There's a bunch of theories all over the place, and and uh, you know I, I I I the answer is nobody really knows. We, I mean I this is one of the great mysteries. Okay, so uh, infinite time is for the human mind, or at least my mind, uh, incomprehensible. On the other hand, if time is finite and there was a beginning, then what came before it? I, you know, I, either either of those problems, uh, you know, turns my head to spin, and I really don't know the answer. And the fact of the matter is, while there are various ideas, the cosmologists and physicists don't know the answer to that either. But there's various ideas. Well, I mean, if there's multiple universes, then then clearly there were ones that existed prior to ours and there will be ones that exist after ours dissipate. Is that if, if you buy into the multiple universes, which is possible, but you know, I'm well, that's not science doesn't accept multiple universes as kind of an accepted consent, kind of a consensus agreement. Uh, I think it's debatable. You know, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure there's a consensus either way. Okay. It could be, but we, you know, we, we, we only have this universe that we're living in to deal with us, at least for for a down to earth person like me who actually deals with elements, okay, and isotopes. Uh, that's the only really one that matters. If there are other universes, we're not able to observe them. So, you oh, know, it doesn't matter. So we've never observed outside our universe. No. 
Okay. No, I mean yeah. that. That's. I mean, there might be multiple ones, but we don't know about them. Got it. Didn't yeah. know that. <clears throat> Before I forget, I want that image we were looking at of the of the uh, from the Hubble telescope. It's very easy to think that we're looking at stars there, but that's just galaxies. So there's not a single star there. That's it, that's just entire galaxies. Whereas we look up in the sky, we don't see galaxies. We see stars. Yeah. I just that's just something I just sort of dawned on me. For, I'm sure Bill, you've known that for years, but um, yeah, it only just dawned on me. Um, I'm interested in your comments about the chemistry of the universe, Bill. Um, we've got a slide here that illustrates the periodic table at the, right after the Big Bang. And then the periodic table that we're all familiar with um, underneath it, which is pretty much right now. Um, perhaps, Gerardo, you can grab that slide. Move down. Yeah, the, there we yeah go. that's the one. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk us through this? This was really fascinating to me. So right at the Big Bang, there's only a, just a couple of a handful of elements. Um, and now we've just got this incredibly, incredible uh, array of elements that have been formed. Do you want to take us through what sort of events have um, have caused that sort of massive explosion in the variety of elements that are that are around us? Right, right. So um, at about so according to the current cosmology, at about. Uh, a microsecond after the Big Bang, that's a really short time, things had finally cooled to the point where you could start to get protons and neutrons. And uh, a, a hydrogen, of course, is just a proton, or oh, there's a hydrogen, too, there's a proton and a neutron. A helium is two protons plus one or two neutrons. Uh, helium, uh, lithium is uh, is three. Uh, protons plus uh, three or four neutrons. Berlillium is uh, um, uh, four protons plus five uh, or ten uh, neutrons. Uh, excuse, excuse me, five or six neutrons. Um, yeah. Anyway, so you start to get protons and neutrons, and 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 then things cool enough so they can begin to associate, and you can begin to make helium. But after about, the universe was expanding so rapidly and cooling so rapidly that after about three minutes, it was not possible to sort of fuse these elements together anymore. So you're left with 99% hydrogen and helium and really only a very wee tad of lithium and even less beryllium. Okay, So that's mm -hmm. the early universe. Every other element in the periodic table was created in stars. And, okay. and so right now, the sun is, uh, of course, per, uh, fusing heat, uh, heat, hydrogen to produce helium. And uh, over the entire history of creating, you know, just like the sun, hasn't changed the ratio of hydrogen to helium very much. What really gets interesting is when stars get geriatric, when they get old, when they convert. And the other thing to understand about a star, it's only in the very core, the very interior part of the star, the star where this fusion's going on, where hydrogen is being fused together to form helium. Eventually, a star it, uh, fuses all the hydrogen in that core to helium. Okay. Now, the other thing you have to understand now, too, is that that the stars have enormous gravity and they just want to collapse on themselves. And what's resisting that collapse is the energy created by that fusion. So once the star has created all the, transformed all that hydrogen into helium in its core, it's it's out of gas. So what happens is the core, it, and it, the gravity now wins, the core collapses. But what happens is the rest of the star expands into what we call a, a, a red giant. And mm. that collapse then allows hydrogen, or excuse me, helium to be fused into carbon and oxygen. Now we're on our way. And by the way, lithium and beryllium aren't made in stars. Uh, they're just skipped. They're actually consumed. So they're skipped. Yeah. But then we start making carbon and oxygen. 
In the meantime, the outside of the star is swelled up. Uh, when this happens to our sun, another four to five billion years, it will swell up to swallow the Earth. Um, yeah. And and then for for a normal sized star like the sun, once it's converted its core into carbon, it's really out of gas. It will never have the energy to to produce higher fusion energy uh, mm -hmm. reactions. It will just dwindle away. It was what we call a white dwarf, just slowly cooling, uh, pushing out energy. But it's it's an ember for yeah. bigger stars. For bigger stars, once they've converted their their cores into carbon, they collapse further, and they create bigger and uh, heavier and heavier elements, up to iron. Okay, and for yeah. a star basically of a mass of about eight or more, once it's created its core its core into into iron. You can't produce energy by fusion anymore for heavier elements. It actually takes energy to make heavier elements. So what happens is now the star collapses and it rebounds and, ex and explodes in a supernova. And everything in the core is, 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 is compressed into neutrons. And these neutrons spew out and are captured. And that's how you make uh, the uh, elements heavier than iron. So. Okay. Um, you know, to make a planet like Earth, you needed stars to be around. Stars live through their lives and die. And one other thing to say about this is that, uh, about the lives of stars, is that, uh, um, you know, doctors tell us that obesity shortens life. Well, in, it's nothing like obesity shortens life in a, in a, in a star. The, the smallest stars, which are about a tenth the size of the sun, basically can have lived the entire history of the universe. They'll live for billion, many tens of billions of years. Uh, the Earth has a life, uh, the sun has a life expectancy, uh, nine, 10 billion years. The biggest mm -hmm. possible stars have life expectancies of a few million years. They quickly consume, and the reason for this is, is the, the pressure and temperature in their cores are such that the fusion reactions go very fast. They quickly consume and, and fuse everything into heavier elements until they run out of gas and explode as, as supernovae. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a very clear correlation between the mass of a star, its life expectancy, how bright it is, uh, and what color it is. Um, big stars are bright. They're hot, blue in color, and yeah. uh, they're very short-lived. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in how scientists are able to, by looking at stars, determine what the chemical composition of them of the stars is. I've, I've, I'm familiar with spectrophotometry in in the, some of the labs that I worked in. I know if you're a if a drug cheat, if you walk past somebody who's taken drugs, um, you know Olympians. If you walk past somebody that's got drugs in them, they can, they can detect extremely tiny amounts of chemicals but i think it's is it the same sort of chemi uh, technology that's used to determine the chemistry the elements that are in these stars yeah i, I think you had a slide there and it, you know it's it's a question of um elements elements <laughs> will absorb specific wavelengths of light and you can look at this absorption spectrum and see what elements uh are present in the uh, in the store um, yeah. so, and, and, you know, at least for, you know, this is how we know everything's mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, we can even detect, uh, you know, very minor elements in the spectroscopy. Uh, we can't detect very accurately what their abundances are though. Um, for, for, for the most, uh, uncommon elements, for the least abundant elements, uh, and try and understand the composition of, of, uh, our solar system anyway, we rely on meteorites. Uh, certain classes of meteorites, but basically that's it. You see that dip, those dips, that's yeah. that, that's the light being absorbed by specific elements. Okay, it, in, it, in, the, in the hydrogen molecule. Electrons, okay, they're being excited. They're capturing the photons and and not letting them pass through. Hmm. So um, let me know if I'm interpreting this right. So there's a couple of things you can learn from that curve. The, the position of the curve on the on the wavelength spectrum is that sort of the the peak there. Does that tell you the age 
of the uh, of the star? Oh, um, no, that doesn't. Uh, that, yeah, I, one other thing I should have added is that uh, is, is that um, you you can uh, stars grow brighter as they age. Okay, and this is because as they're converting hydrogen in their cores to helium. Uh, the hydrogen's more dense. This allows them to collapse a little bit and, mm -hmm. and the fusion reactions to run a little bit higher. Uh, so they actually run a little bit brighter with age. Um, mostly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we look at the, the relationship, the theoretical expectation between mass uh, and, uh, and, and, and temperature and, uh, and the age of stars. And we also know stars are kind of uh, uh, they're they're not produced individually. They're produced in stellar nurseries. Okay, so we can look at groups of stars and uh, look at the age distributions and and basically tell how old those that distribution of stars is. Because if it's an old distribution, all all the big stars would have died away. So if you see a group of stars and they're all small, you know that's a very old group. Okay. Well, that's probably a good point to jump into talking about galaxies. So I'm interested in why galaxies form, um, which are basically large groups of billions of stars, I guess, aren't they? Most galaxies have got billions of stars or hundreds of millions of stars in them. So is how, the what is, why do the galaxies form? Well, uh, when, when matter, when, you know, when the Big Bang happened, matter was distributed unevenly okay yeah. and it means that there was more matter in some regions and more gravity and so gravity just sort of began to pull things together now there's some specific theories that i'm not that familiar with as to this heterogeneity and distribution of matter after the big bang uh, but basically you get some constant uh, concentration of matter which is just hydrogen and helium really in certain areas and that's greater gravity and then they begin to pull things together and you begin to form, you know, uh, high concentrations of gas, and then you begin to form high concent, you know, and and high enough that things collapse to form stars, and uh, and you get a bunch of these, and you get a galaxy. So so that's how they form. Um, yeah. Oh, the other thing that relates to this, and there were questions on black holes too. Um, how do We've you make a, a slide that we can? Put up there to help you yeah. perhaps talk through this so, so we talked about how stars explode in supernovae if yeah. if the star is big enough and also as it evolves through its red giant phase each are throwing in that phase they're throwing out enormous amount of of, of gas and, and and matter and sometimes they throw enough away uh that they never will collapse into a supernova but if they if you have a really big star and it survives this red giant phase the star can collapse into a black hole that, that light can't escape it. um and uh so that's the easiest way to make a black hole is to uh, have have a, a an extremely large star basically run out of glass have its core collapse into density, matter of density uh, so great that, that light can't escape. Um, and, you know, it, it turns out that most galaxies seem to have black holes at their center. And these are really massive black holes, not too massive to be created by a single star. But once you have a bunch of black holes, they can then attract each other and also pull in stars, and they'll naturally grow over time. Um, the, it turns out that the, the greatest concentration of matter is in the greatest concentration of light, as you can see in that slide, is in the galactic center. There's plenty mm -hmm. of stars for these black holes to feed on, uh, to pull in, rip apart, and, and become part of their, their, their black holes. But you can start this whole process by making one just with an exploding large star. So it's fair to say that it's mo is it more than likely that every galaxy has a black hole? Yes, uh, that's the consensus uh, among astronomers. It's just it's, that they haven't haven't done the hard work of finding 
um, the black hole. They're, they're very difficult to image. I mean, they, you know, yeah. we suspected for a long, long time there's a black hole at the center of the galaxy, uh, the, of our galaxy, the Milky Way. But this image is very recent. It's a radio image. You can't see it with light. There's just too much stuff in the way. Uh, yeah. Look at it with visible light. Uh, so there's that's a whole bunch of radio uh, astronomy images they've strung together to produce that yeah. thing. So uh, I think the um, the original black hole photograph that we all saw a few years ago was of a black good. hole that was like a billion times the size of this one. It was just massive compared to this. Oh yeah, our own black hole. So it was easier to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, yeah. there's billions of stars in the galaxy. So you know, the fact that you have a, a black hole. Actually, there's hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy. If you have a black hole that's a billion stars or so, billion solar masses, yeah. 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 And this is fascinating. This image that we're showing here on the right is it like it's only like about two weeks, three weeks, or a month old, I think. It's only when a, when a whole bunch of telescopes all over the world um, basically uh, combined their power and then with some very sophisticated software, they were able to um, come up with this image. So this is a very historic moment to find uh, the black hole in our own galaxy. Yeah. So uh, I don't um, – is there a simple explanation for what a black hole is or where um, – I mean, it's, it's drawing in all of this matter. Where does it go? <laughs> Yeah, the the explanation is 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 that you know line uh, it goes back to Einstein. Uh, light has uh, has mass, and it re light responds to gravity. Photons yeah. respond to gravity, and you can have so much gravity that light simply can't ex can't escape. Um, and what you see in that black hole is you know the center nothing. That's because light's not coming out. But everything's really hot around it. It's stuff is swirling around, yeah. Yeah. being being sucked into it. Um, so the outside of the black hole is going to be pretty bright because of all the energy that it releases. Things are being sucked in. But yeah. once the matter gets in there, uh, it can't escape. Well, sort of. Now, now you take this gets beyond my understanding. But at least according to Stephen Hawking, um, you know there can be some evaporation of matter from a from the black hole, but it's just, it's so much mass and so much gravity that light can't escape. That's a black hole. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Mm. And then they, they organize, you know, these, they organize the rotation of the galaxy around them. So that's where the center of mass of the galaxy is. And that's, you know, you can see mm. the spiral arms, things rotating around the, around the center. Mm. Mm. I had a question there, but it's just popped out of my head. Anyone else got I, any questions I, about black holes? <laughs> well, I was going to, I was going to kind of make a, a semi joke. Um, one, one of our, our viewers said, okay, so, so Dr. You know, Dr. White, you know, where's Kolob? <laughs> but I mean, for me, for me, like, Listening to Bill White talk about our the cosmology, our universe, it's so inspiring. Like it's it's yeah. not easy to follow, but it's deep and it's rich and it's profound and it's fascinating. And it deserves so much respect. When I taught when I asked Bill White about Kolob and Joseph's mistranslations of the Egyptian papyrus into the equivalent of religious psychobabble, you know, it's, it's disrespecting a, a discipline that is serious and profound and has had really <laughs> important implications for all of us in this human existence. And so yeah. I just have to say it's silliness. It's, it's complete absurdity to compare the wisdom and the knowledge of Bill White with kind of Joseph Smith's rambling gibberish about yeah things he knows really nothing about. But I'm sorry, I, I digress. But that Well, no, you're giving me time to remember what I'd forgotten. Well, that so was my question, know, Dr. Bill White. Is my observation was... You, you didn't tell us... Was, that was great, Bill White, but where's Colab? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You don't have to answer that. 
Oh, yeah, but yeah, I'll tell you a couple of things about stars. You look up in the night sky, and those are all giant stars. The ones you see with your eyes are the really big ones, and they're really rare. You don't see all the little stars, the stars that are, <laughs> that are smaller than the sun. They're not bright enough. Oh, you see, you need a telescope to see them. Uh, you see them yeah. good with a telescope, but those are all bright stars. Um, the, yeah. yeah, right. It, um, so there's, and, and those are, the bright ones are a very small fraction of the total number of stars. Yeah. And we talk about the sun being a, an average star. Uh, not really. Two thirds of the stars in the in in the in the galaxy are smaller than the Earth, uh, or maybe even more than that. And the Earth, the one solar mass, stars can get up to maybe ten, a hundred solar masses. So we're on the small end of the range, but on the other hand, we're bigger than most stars in terms of our yeah. of our yeah. sun. Yeah, the Earth's sun is bigger than most stars. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Most stars are little, yeah. and they'll live practically forever. Interesting. Yeah. The, the thing that I'd forgotten was that, um, and, and Bill mentioned this briefly, that, you know, Einstein predicted this. So ba black holes, Einstein was smart enough to predict these things before they'd even observed them. Mm. Okay. So that's, these guys know what they're talking about. I mean, it, it's absolutely brilliant that, that scientists can, based on all of the evidence, come up with and all the laws that they've discovered, can predict things that they should be seeing and then find these things. So oh, speaking of Einstein, there was another uh, question that, uh, uh, that I noticed this morning that it probably should be answered. Uh, yeah. And that is about whether the, uh, you know, what's the ultimate fate of the universe? Uh, it's expanding now, but will it continue to? Um, it yeah. turns out that the rate of expansion is actually increasing. Again, when I first started teaching 30-some um, years ago, the, the, yeah. we were wondering if you know gravity wouldn't slow it down. In particular, these numerous tiny particles called neutrinos, whether they were some, sufficiently massive to make the universe collapse on itself. Um, so that, that was the thinking. It turns out that careful measurements show that actually the universe is, ex, is ex, expansion is accelerating. Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, this, yeah. this is the dark energy uh, hypothesis. Uh, and uh, so, and the ultimate fate of the universe is to expand and expand and expand. And, and as it does, it will use up all, all the matter will be condensed into stars. It will all be converted. Everything will be converted into either black holes or white dwarfs like the, the fate of the sun. There'll be no more energy. The universe will be dead. And that's, you know, like a million years down the road. So it's not really, we have to worry, worry about it. But actually, um, it, the rate of expansion is increasing. Yeah. Uh, do, uh, let's move on and talk about <laughs> the. Uh... Um, it is an equation put in a, a, what he calls a cosmological constant uh, to ex yeah. account for an expanding universe. They call it a great mistake. Well, it turns out he was right by putting that in. <laughs> Okay, for those who are really interested in, um, before we move on to, to talk about our solar system, for those who are interested in learning about black holes and anything astrophysics related, uh, I can recommend Becky Smith's her Smith her Smithhurst website. She's an um, astrophysicist at the University of Oxford, and she has her own little YouTube channel, and she's just absolutely fantastic to listen to very enthusiastic and just a really great communicator a lot like john perry really good at communicating very complex uh, scientific stuff so um harada will put the link to her website um in the yeah. notes at the end of the, the podcast. so let's move to our solar system um bill do you want to describe how the solar system 
um, came into existence, what, okay. what it's composed of, sort of how this, this, you know, we started, this, the planet started coalescing around the, the sun, yeah. rotating around the sun. Right. So, so really star, to hear that story. Stars form in uh, gas rich regions, um, one of which, at least in the, if you're in the northern hemisphere, and in the winter sky, you can see Orion, the constellation Orion at night looks like a kite. And, but it's actually a saber, but I think of the tail and its kite. If you look down at seven star, the second star down, it's fuzzy it, because it's not a star. It's a nebula. It's a, it's a region of dense gas where stars are forming. So you get these regions of dense gas and then uh, that are sort of semi-stable because the gas is turbulent and these sorts of things. But somehow uh, the gas, there's a whole lot of gravity in here. So parts of the gas start to collapse in under themselves under gravity. And uh, and as they do, because there's, you know, this, this spinning and, and uh, random motion in the galaxy, it begins, to, the gas begins to spin, pulls itself tighter and tighter, into a star and 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 also with a basically uh, you could think of it sort of as a as a ring sort of like saturn about it except not not really a ring it's actually a a disk of gas that's that at that point and we can see with hubble space telescope looking into that uh, uh, that orion nebula you can actually see these stars being born, these regions with this gas disk. And then in some cases, a star just beginning to peek out, uh, let it slide out through that dense uh, disk of gas. Um, and, uh, and, and the inner parts of, these, of this disk get very, very hot. And almost all the matter in this, in this spinning disk of gas gets ultimately pulled in to form the star, but not all of it. And the leftovers form planets. Okay. And in some cases, I, I'm, don't hold me to this, I think it's the star Beta Pictoris. We can actually see a planet looks like it's beginning to carve out a clearing in the disk. Okay. So it's probably a giant planet like, like a Jupiter that's forming from the gas and the dust within this uh, this disk. And the inner parts of these disks are very hot because they're being compressed as the gas is being pulled out. There's radiation from the new star starting to, starting to heat everything up too. So they're very mm -hmm. hot. Well, planets in the inner part of these disks, like the Earth, Mars, Venus, Mercury, um, end up with not very much gas. Remember that the, the Everything in the universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, and then following that's oxygen and and uh, and, and carbon, things that form gases. Um, mm -hmm. Inner planets don't get their share of these gases, uh, so they're mo mostly rocky and iron. Uh, all all um, four of the terrestrial planets consist of mostly of rock and iron. Uh, the outer ones, where things were cooler. Uh, you could get water ice to condense, condense out around uh, the, the orbit of Jupiter. That allowed those planets to grow more rapidly because the, the you know, ice particles are, are basically dust. They're solid. Uh, they pull together the gas and you form these outer planets uh, mm -hmm. much earlier. So, so basically that's how it happens. Um, well, I, I have a question about that. So yeah. the the... The sun itself is mostly hydrogen and helium. Is that because those particles have less inertia, so they're able to collapse into the star while the other things get left behind? Or is the sun itself also made of the same stuff that Earth is, but also just a bunch of gas? Okay. So um, the, the, the reason is that hydrogen and helium don't condense very well. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of momentum. Um, the, 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 the basic ingredients of everything in the solar system is the same. And, and it, the, 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 gas, the cloud of gas and dust that ultimately formed the solar system basically had the composition of the sun because almost all the mass of the solar system is in the sun. It's just in the inner planets because these gases don't condense into solids, things like hydrogen, helium, uh, carbon is mostly carbon monoxide, 
uh, uh, most of the oxygen, well, the oxygen actually does condense, condense to form silicates, um, but nitrogen doesn't condense either. So we end up with not our share of these gaseous things, these elements. Uh, and we're ended up with things like silicon and, you know, silicates and, and calcium, magnesium, all these iron, mm -hmm. uh, these heavier elements that like to form solids. Um, okay. On the outer part of the solar system where things are cooler, Jupiter almost has the same composition of the sun. It's a little richer oh, in really. the sun. It's a little richer in some of the heavier elements, but it's got almost its full share of the of, of the uh, of the gas, uh, the nebular gas uh, that was formed. But the inner planets, we just got the things that condense at, at high temperature. That's interesting, and mm -hmm. and we're still leaking off helium and hydrogen that escapes, right? Yes, uh, yeah. particularly helium, hydrogen. Most of the hydrogen in the atmosphere is tied up as, as oxygen. Uh, yeah. With oxygen is water, so we don't water, leak yeah. much of that. But we are leaking helium, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. and, and Mars mm -hmm. leaked most of its hydrogen <laughs> and most of its water. Uh, yeah. but we have enough gravity to hold on to most of it. But probably we may well mm -hmm. have lost a lot of it in the initial stage of its formation. Uh, when it was very hot, mm -hmm. probably hot enough um, for the entire planet to be molten as it formed. Right. So we've actually got a slide that shows just to sort of illustrate how the composition is of the sun compared to just the earth. But, but obviously there's a considerable difference in the chemical composition of all of the planets um, going from the rocky ones out through to the, uh, the gaseous giants or out further um but it is remarkable the, the the chemical difference between the sun uh, and the earth as you can see in that slide yeah yeah we're, we're everything and most of what the earth is in that little slot of the one percent of the sun and that's the earth's yeah. crust uh if you took the whole composition of the earth you'd see a lot more magnesium and a lot more iron uh but otherwise in the iron being in the core, right? Well, right, not yeah. only in the core, but a lot of it. Yeah. So that's where the water is, John. I was just going to ask. I didn't see water, but that's the crust. <laughs> so I want to see the the chem the the breakdown of the core and see how much HTO H two O is down there in yeah. the core. Um, I, I don't think anybody thinks there's much water in the core. <laughs> well, we know we know a few tens of thousands of people that do, but that's another okay, part. So yeah. How do we know that the core consists of iron? First of all, we know what the mass of the Earth is. Okay? Uh, the, the, this was discovered uh, oh, about in the late 1700s, and they calculated the mass of the Earth. Um, so... And we know what its volume is, so we know what its density is. And it's pretty dense. It's about um, five grams per cc. Um, density of water is one gram per cc. And no matter how much you condense water, you're not going to get it up, uh, you know, squeeze ice, you're not going to get up to that high density. The other thing we know is how that mass is distributed in the Earth. First of all, the density of the grams per uh per cc so we can't make uh an entire earth out of the material in the crust it must be some more dense greater dense stuff at depth the other thing we know about the earth is its moment of inertia okay and uh basically the more mass you have concentrated in the outer part of a of a spinning body the greater its moment of inertia and, Probably people who first invented wheels figured this out. That it's better to have spokes uh, and all the mass and the wheel on the outside uh, than, than a solid wheel because it makes it more stable because it has more uh, angular momentum uh, or in moment of inertia. Yeah. Anyway, we know what the moment of inertia is. That's telling us mass is concentrated in the summit in, in the center of the Earth. We know what elements are available to make the Earth. And, uh, and uh, that would have that density. And when you get down to what's possible, 
what's available in this solar nebula to make stuff that's dense enough to make the interior of the Earth. Turns out that you have to have a core that's about uh, 90% uh, iron, 5% nickel, and then a few percent of some lighter element. And there's lots of debate about what that is. We haven't quite figured that the light element out, but it actually could be hydrogen. Um, but let me also say that, yes, yeah, so there's, no, there's no water in the core. It's just not going to have the density. But there's a lot of water in the mantle, actually. There's probably at least an ocean's worth of, of water in the mantle. Um, the, the, the problem is not that there's uh, uh, not that there's not water in the Earth's interior, but in terms of creating a flood, it's just how do you get it out suddenly? Okay. If When volcanoes erupt, uh, the principal gas that's driving those explosive eruptions is water. There's plenty of water in the interior of the Earth. I mean, not enough to make things wet, but and and you know, the water is present not as water molecules, uh, but as hydrated minerals. So things like micas have water intrinsically in their structure. Uh, clay minerals have water intrinsically in their structure. So the water is structurally contained within minerals in the, in the Earth's interior. Right. Okay. They answer your question, John. Okay. <clears throat> That's all right. Let's, um, I'm Thanks really keen to move that. on now to to looking at the uh, what you mentioned that the Earth was molten, likely to be molten in its early history. Do you want to go through um, what science suggests has how the Earth shifted from the point where it was just first formed to a point where, you know, life um, emerged on the Earth. We, it's not too many million years after the Earth formed that uh, there are signs of life on the Earth. So can you talk us through how the Earth shifted from a point where it was just a molten ball to when oceans started appearing and uh, where that water might have come from? Rain, clouds, that sort of thing. When do those sort of events start occurring? Okay. Well, it turns out um, to actually have cooled the earth down to being pretty much solid would not have taken all that long. Certainly, you would have had a solid crust within um, millions or tens of millions of years. So this is not a long time in, in geologic history. Now, it turns out that we, you know, we know very well, very accurately, the age of the solar system is 4.567 billion years. We don't know the age of the Earth so accurately. We think it's probably maybe even 100 million years younger than that. That, that would be the maximum amount younger um, because we have nothing to date. Nothing survives from that time. The oldest thing we have are actually zircon minerals. Uh, in rocks in Western Australia. And these go back to 4.2 or so, or even a little older, 4.2 billion years old. Zircons are like time capsules because they're rich in uranium, have hardly any lead, and uranium decays the lead. So by measuring the amount of lead and its isotopic composition, we can date these yeah. things very accurately. Um, now, the other thing about these, about those, some of those zircons is there's some evidence that it looks like they might have crystallized in the presence of water, something about the, the trace element compositions. So that's the first evidence that maybe back even before uh, 4 billion years old, uh, maybe as old as 4.2 or 4.3, we, we began to have, have oceans uh, present on the earth. In terms of real okay. solid evidence, uh, we go back to about 3.8, 3.9 billion years, and there's sedimentary rocks that, that, that is composed of minerals that fell and settled out of water. So we have oceans at least, let's face it, more than 4 billion years ago. Right. So, sed so sedimentary rocks are ones that have formed from the, I guess, the metamorphic or the igneous rocks that would have been present. So yes. In other words, waters acted on those and eroded them, and then there's formed another rock. Yeah, what, what happens yeah. Is, is minerals, uh, uh, igneous rocks break down by in, in the atmosphere between rain and, 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 uh, and other chemical reactions into, in a, say, clay minerals. And these yeah. clay minerals then settle out to form, uh, to form uh, 
uh, sedimentary rocks, layer by layer. And so we, the first yeah. sedimentary rocks we know about are about 3.8, 3.9 billion years old. Right. So there's definitely water by then. Yeah. Um, we've got a, you provided me a, a lovely slide of a, I think it's a, it's a meteorite. Yeah. We might uh, get you to talk through that slide, Bill. This is the uh, oldest object. So this is something that's on the earth, but it's older than the earth. Is that right? Yes, this is the uh, a media the meteorite Allende that fell in um, in Mexico in um, 1969. It's a carbonaceous chondrite kind of mineral. Um, now it it probably came from a small. It's a piece of a small asteroid. Let's put it that way. Um, but it's composed of a bunch of different things. You you pointed out the chondrules. So these are. These were once molten droplets. And they're partly glass, they're partly crystallized, but they're droplets. They're, they're the dust in this solar nebula. At one point, places, at times and places, got so hot that the dust melted into droplets. That's what those chondrules are. Now, mm -hmm. you pointed out the calcium aluminum inclusions. These are even more interesting. These have the composition that if you take uh, you know, the the composition of a uh, of the solar nebula, which again is sort of the the sun. You heat it up to the point where almost where basically everything evaporates, everything turns into a gas. It's so hot, and then you let it condense. You lower temperature and let things condense. What you get is the composition of calcium aluminum inclusions. Okay, so they match. A, a, condensate from very high temperatures. And it turns out, um, because they're rich in, in uranium and poor in lead, because uranium is one of those elements that will condense at very high temperatures, but lead is not. It condenses very low temperatures. So you can date these things by uranium lead extremely accurately. And that's where we get that 4.5678 uh, number on, okay. on the age of the universe. Everything else after that's a little older. The chondrules, a lot of the chondrules can be dated as well. They're a million or two million years older. Um, by two million years, we begin to get um, evidence that there were already asteroids. Uh, Vesta may, may have formed as, as, as early as two million years after they, those, okay. uh, we call them CAIs, calcium aluminum inclusions. They're the oldest things we know about in the, in the solar system, and, and they're, they define, as far as we're concerned, time zero in solar system history. And so the, and, so the sun, sun is that age, pretty much. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 the nebula that began collapsing, man, that may have begun, you know, uh, millions or maybe a couple million years before that, um, but the time when we, at the first datable thing is that 4.567. At this point, we already have some, some sort of proto-sun, though. Uh, admittedly, we probably have a sun that's forming. A proto-sun, by which I mean it hasn't reached the density to ignite nuclear fusion in its, in its core. It's giving off yeah. energy only because it's collapsing. Um, that that's really neat. So you're saying that the sun hadn't yet turned on when some of these meteorites would have been forming. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. What well, would that it take night in terms of nuclear fusion? Right. Uh, right. But they still and we see these stars, um, uh, and they're still shine. Uh, in the sky because of the energy, they're, the gravitational energy they're releasing from the, the uh, 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 from from their collapse, but it takes a few million years before the cores can collapse and actually ignite uh, nuclear fusion. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's I know there was another question about uh, 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 that, that could be answered by that slide. This is a carbonaceous chondrite has a lot of carbon in it. And among those carbon uh, containing uh, um, uh, molecules are, although not necessarily in the case of this Allende, uh, but particularly in the case of another meteorite, Murchison, 
uh, which fell in Australia in, I forget, it was 1959 or 1969, including amino acids. Okay, and lots of other organic molecules, things we normally think of as being only possible to make through, um, through life. I, I just, okay. uh, you know, throw in this statement that um, amino acids are not so tricky to make. Uh, they consist of a carboxylic acid group and an, and a, an amine group, which are sort of common kind of uh, um, um, semi-molecules, if you want. Um, the trick is, and, and you guys know a lot more about this than I do, the trick is stringing those amino acids into, you know, into chains that make proteins. That's the real yeah. trick. We've we got a slide here. Meteorites. Yeah. We find the, the amino acids. Yeah. Might get Gerardo to put up that slide of glycine. So this is a very common amino acid. We've all got heaps of glycine in us. Yeah, um, glycine is the simplest really amino acid. And so that, that blue is a nitrogen. It's bound to two whites, which are hydrogen. Uh, the blacks are carbon. Uh, the reds are oxygen. That's a pretty simple thing to, to make. Uh, and so the fact that we find it in meteorites is 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 not so astounding but i should tell you one thing again and again uh, simon and john know more about this than i do but it turns out that all the amino acids in some not glycine uh, but most amino acids can be either left-handed or right-handed depending on how you orient them but all the ones in life are left-handed in, in meteorites uh, some are left-handed some are right-handed <laughs> yeah okay so there was a it's a critical point in, in the evolution of life when they went one direction. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. We, um, so, I thought... Oh, well, just to point out why this is so interesting for life, that it was once thought that amino acids, which are the building blocks of life, some of the building blocks of life, it, it was once thought that they could only be created by cells because cells have this complex metabolism that produces these. And we found that all sorts of amino acids can be found in meteorites. So they're, they're forming abiotically just in our solar system, as well as sugars and all sorts of things. And we'll, we'll probably talk about that more here in a little bit. But it, yeah. this was actually a prediction made by scientists that uh, in the Miller-Urey experiment that, oh, this these things should be easier to produce abiotically outside of biology than we previously thought. And then these things were found in meteorites. So it's a really nice example of prediction. Yeah. Yeah. Followed by observation. Yeah, the Miller Yuri experiment. Yuri is the guy for which my medal is named after. I would just point that out. That's the one he, I mentioned. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he was a great scientist. Incredible what he did. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Bill, can you just in a minute just describe what the Earth was like when, I mean, we've got a rough idea when life emerged on the Earth. Which, we can argue over 100, 500 million years or whatever, but what were the conditions like on the Earth at around the time that life emerged? And then we'll get, I'd, I'd like to invite John Perry to come in and talk about some of the ideas that scientists are tossing around about the earliest events that have taken place in, in, in that shift from being an abiotic world to a biotic world. So what was the Earth like? What were the conditions like? Okay. Uh well, well, first of all, in terms of the surface of the Earth, we probably didn't have as much continental volume as we did. So there was a lot more ocean and a lot less land. Uh oh You there? Somehow I lost, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I lost video, I don't know why. Um, but uh, my screen's all black. Anyway, a lot less land, I'll just keep talking. We can see you. Actually, I think we might have lost. I think we lost him. Yeah, I've just got a frozen, frozen bill. Yeah. Where do you want to go next, uh, Simon? We can wait for him on the background if he comes back. Uh, if it only takes a minute or so, I'd probably rather wait for him to come back in. If Can we do that? Yeah, I don't. Something's happening. I, um, no, he just went black. Must he? Yeah, because yeah. I know. I know. Bill is very interested in uh, hearing 
John talk about uh, some astrobiology. Uh, John just... Perry, you're muted, John Perry. Yeah, let's just talk about some of the things that he was he was mentioning here because there's there's I mean there's a ton of stuff that he went over. One of the things that's striking to me is how so when he was talking about what the earth is made of, this is all pieced together by understanding physics, by understanding the density of different uh, you know, different types of atoms, different types of molecules, understanding how those would react under pressure. And it's a very complicated story that people have been debating about, testing, experimenting with for a long time to give us this model of what's inside the earth and how that works. And there's a bunch of different, you know, subfields that are testing those ideas and double checking things. I mean, you have, there are, I don't even know what the field is called, but there's, there's a way when there's an earthquake that you can track how those vibrations are ricocheting off things inside the earth. And that actually, that, that kind of gives you a way to image what's inside the planet. So you have a bunch of different stations around the earth that are measuring these vibrations and you can actually kind of get sonar of the earth that way. And you've got people that are modeling this just from an understanding of physics and just crunching all the numbers and figuring out what, 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 what do we know from the periodic table? What are the densities of these things? What must the core of the earth be made of? And then of course we can test things that are spewing out of the earth during volcanoes. And so it's just really cool combination of all these observations plus math and our understanding of physics combined with all sorts of clever ways to, to double check ourselves. Yeah. And the way this works in science is everybody is motivated to publish papers and to make a name for themselves by discovering something interesting. And other people are motivated to argue with them. Uh, if, if uh, what they published has errors in it and it's this beautiful mess, this ongoing fight really in science that gives us these, clearer and clearer images of something even that's invisible to us, like the center, what's in the center of the earth. And it's just an amazing process how that all works. Right. Yeah. Simon, where do you want to go next? How, um, what are the chances of getting Bill back? <laughs> I don't, I don't think he's going to, it's going to happen. He's not, he's not on the back room anymore either. Okay. I suppose um, we sent him a link to it when it's done, huh? I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, look, okay, so we, we got up to the point where the earth is ready, the conditions. Uh, I was hoping that Bill was going to be able to yeah. tell us what, you know, what was the conditions in the atmosphere. There was no oxygen, okay. <laughs> you would have died instantly in, in the conditions back then. So we're talking about, you know, 4 billion years ago on the earth. Um, so it, so what science is now trying to do is to reproduce those conditions and using chemistry, try to come up with ways in which, um, theories about how life could have emerged on the earth. And this is where I'm really keen to, to bring John Perry in to, to talk about, you know, how complicated this story is. I mean, the most the simplest forms of life currently on the earth are extremely complex, yeah. aren't they? So it's, uh, yeah. it's very difficult to, to work back to something when you don't have um, terribly much evidence mm -hmm. uh, to work with. Yeah, can we bring up the slides? Because those slides have the, uh, yeah, I've got a model of a cell on there. So yeah, this, this cell here, this is mycoplasma uh, mycoides, this thing is one of the simplest organisms on the planet. This is an illustration by David Goodsell, and he does these amazing illustrations where he, he's he's showing you all of the macro molecules, so like water molecules and stuff he ignores. But so these we're seeing the the DNA is in yellow here. These yellow strings. You have the ribosome, which is the thing that translates genes into protein. Those are the uh, globs in pink there. And then there's little little pink strings coming out of those globs. Those are, are going into those globs. Those are chains of RNA. And so, you know, this is this is one of the simplest organisms 
on our planet. Now you have you have other things that a lot of people consider to be alive, like viruses and even viroids, which are far simpler than this, but they depend on a cell that's at least this complicated in order to reproduce. Mm. Kind yeah. of cheating to say that they represent truly simpler forms of life. I mean, this is basically as simple as we can go. This is an independent living organism. So the, the viruses cheat by hacking into these cells and right. exploiting their inner workings. So the, Yeah, so COVID, COVID is not a, it's a cheating organism. Right, right. It's not, so, it can't reproduce itself. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah, it needs it needs us to to reproduce. I suppose you could say we're yeah. we're cheating too because we uh, we have to eat stuff. We have yeah. to eat other <laughs> organisms to survive. But plants, there yeah. are lots of plants that are you could say nearly fully independent because they're photosynthesizing. They do they do need like nitrogen fixation, which they get from bacteria and so on. But uh, the the big mystery for the origin of life is how on earth did you get something this complex with all of these cooperating parts from the chaos, far more chaotic chemical reactions and so on that we see elsewhere in the solar system. And it, if you look at a cell, so far as we can tell, everything, it's just a chemical system. Everything is physics and chemistry, just interacting in a very specific way, but it's physics and chemistry. Well, how do you get the more chaotic physics of the universe that we see elsewhere and to form something this insanely complicated? And if we can zoom in on the slide there again, uh, I, I just kind of list some of the, the the complexity here. So even the simple, even simple modern cells are far too complex to have come about by chance or just through the normal processes of physics and chemistry. They possess and maintain hundreds of essential genes. An essential gene is one where if you knock it out, the whole cell will die. They control thousands of distinct chemical reactions in their metabolism. They're actively controlling those chemical reactions. They sense and they respond appropriately to many environmental cues. They build and depend on complex proteins and ribozymes. These are molecular machines. And they use the genetic code. If we go to the next slide. And we do know of two hypothetical processes that are capable of generating complexity like this. So an engineer or a team of engineers could hypothetically produce something like this. It's never happened yet, actually. We've we've been able to uh, reproduce cells from scratch, but we haven't been able to like design them on our own from the bottom up and, and get them working. Uh, and then the other process is evolution by natural selection. And on the next slide, I, I kind of di dive into what that is. So Darwinian evolution or evolution by natural selection is you need something that can replicate and you need something that can have variation when it replicates, and that variation needs to be heritable. So replication plus heritable variation plus selection equals open-ended Darwinian evolution. You know, I think you guys talked about this in one of your earlier uh, podcasts, so I, I don't yeah. want to go too much over this again, but the, the process of evolution can generate incredible complexity. The problem is, in order for evolution to get going, you need something that can replicate with heritable variation. And I've simplified things a little bit here. In order to get open-ended Darwinian evolution, the amount of variation that you have per generation or per replication, there's kind of a sweet spot. And that sweet spot depends on how complex the replicator is. So if it's a really complex replicator, if you get too much variation, the thing can completely break if there's too much variation in each generation each uh, replication event. The simpler it is, the more variation it can withstand. But uh, so there's some complications here, but essentially we need to start, our starting point has to be a replicator with heritable variation that can then be acted upon by natural selection. Once you get that, you can get Darwinian evolution to spiral out of control and create all sorts of complex things like cells and eventually people that have podcasts and so on. But yeah, it starts out, you need a replicator to start with. So on the next slide, yeah. the, the ultimate goal in origin of life research, this is the, the, the white whale that everyone's after. We want, <coughs> we want to be able to find the simplest possible chemical <coughs> systems 
that are capable of open-ended evolution. And how simple do those systems need to be? They need to be so simple that we could consider them to be prebiotically plausible, that they could have gotten kickstarted on the early earth without any other sort of guiding thing, right? Uh, we talked about amino acids being simple enough to be produced in meteorites. We're finding them in meteorites. We're also finding all sorts of sugars and uh, nucleobases, other building blocks of life that we used to think were so complex that only cells could build them. We're finding those in meteorites. And there are, there's a, a, a new little field of, of uh, physics that's budding right now. I'm not sure that it'll actually take off, but it's called assembly theory. Assembly theory is where people are trying to look at the complexity of a molecule or a system and determine how likely that is to, to pop to pop up by chance, uh, <coughs> how likely it is to be generated in a specific environmental condition. And uh, you know the, the systems that most scientists are studying right now for the origin of life appear to be still, they're a lot simpler than modern cells, but they're still a little bit too complex to, to say like, like, we figured it out. So there still is quite a bit of mystery on how yeah. life originated. But there are two main candidates that I'm going to show on the next slide. We have cyclical reactions or proto-metabolism. So these are, these are reactions that are similar to what we find inside of cells. So you've got molecule A that interacts with molecule B to produce molecule C. And then molecule C turns around produce, and interacts with molecule B to produce molecule A. So you have this cyclical reaction where the molecules are cooperating to build each other. Uh, there are many examples of these types of reactions that are prebiotically plausible. And one of the ideas being investigated, and you know, some people think this is a, a really promising line of, of research, others are more doubtful, but is some suspect that you could actually get these metabolic reactions to undergo a form of Darwinian evolution. And eventually give rise to open-ended evolution. Uh, the other big, most promising candidates are polymers. And this is a, a lot of researchers in the field have been studying polymers. Polymers are chain-like molecules. So we, we saw that amino acid earlier. It was that, that, uh, that one fairly simple molecule. Well, a bunch of those can be linked together into a chain, what we call a polymer. And you can have different types of amino acids linked into a chain. And, and that polymer can do all sorts of complicated things. Uh, RNA is another chain-like molecule. It's, it's made of little building blocks that we call nucleotides. And there are four different types of nucleotides in modern RNA. There are four different types of nucleotides as well in modern DNA. In the past, there might have been more types of nucleotides that were in these these polymers, but this is a very promising field uh, or direction of research. These are polymers are very promising for candidates as the first replicators because they can do really, really amazing things. And so we do have an animation to watch, but it looks like Bill is back on. So He's back ah. online. Ah, hello. Oh, brilliant. Uh, apologies. Uh, battery went in. Uh, I should have had right. a right. plug in before this thing started. Okay. So I'll just, yeah. So what were things like? Here's the most important thing. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Look at our neighbors, Venus, Mars, both atmospheres, 90% uh, CO2, 10% nitrogen. That's what the Earth's atmosphere would have been like, okay? And uh, an, another important ingredient, ingredient in the atmosphere, although a trace gas, even then, was probably methane. Um, I mentioned earlier that suns grow brighter as they age, just like people would. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so here's the thing. When the Earth formed, the sun was like 30% less bright than it is today. In the absence of anything else, the Earth would have been frozen. 
So that greater amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the amount of methane ray, were, were produced enough greenhouse effect to keep uh, temperatures above freezing. So we had liquid water at least 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago because we had a big greenhouse effect. Lots of CO2 in the atmosphere, probably some methane, no oxygen. Uh, oxygen in the atmosphere is completely and totally due to photosynthesis. Again, to life, yeah. Right, so early life, early life comes along before there's oxygen and it's but before we get, it's not until, oh, well, there's hints of oxygen, whiffs, uh, going back 3 billion years and more, it's not till about 2.4 billion years ago that the atmosphere becomes oxidizing. Yeah. Okay. There's real significant amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And there's lots of evidence of that. Um, uh, just one example, when we look at paleosols, that means ancient so soils, um, older than 2.4 billion years old. They have no iron. Paleosols now, you can think of a red, red soil, old soils are red. That's because the iron is in its oxidized state and is insoluble. It doesn't wash out of the soil. It's the last thing that comes out of a soil, just about that and the aluminum. Um, in reduced state, in the absence of oxygen, iron is soluble. Mm -hmm. okay. And and so it would have washed out of those ancient Archean uh, soils. Another very interesting thing about this time, about 2.4 billion years ago, oh, we see these things called banded iron formations. Okay, they're huge so in some cases. Well, some there's small ones, but some of them around, particularly around 2.4 billion years ago, are huge layers of alternating. Uh, basically silica or quartz and, and iron oxides. Um, hmm. And th they actually, these things actually supply most of the iron uh, that society now is uses. One of the very biggest is the Hammersley uh, deposit in, in Australia. The way we think these things happen was photosynthesis was happening in the surface water of the ocean. And so organisms had evolved to produce photosynthesis. So we had oxygen in the surface water of the ocean, but the deep water, there still was no oxygen. The deep water would upwell near coast, come to the surface, and the iron would be oxidized and precipitate out. And they're banded, we think, probably because this was a sort of seasonal thing, just as seasonal upwelling occurs in the modern ocean. Lots of evidence that the earth, uh, that life made the atmosphere oxidizing. The other interesting thing about this time about 2.4 billion years ago is there was a giant climate crash, okay? What may have been a snowball earth, the earth entirely frozen, the surface of the ocean almost entirely frozen over. And there's another event like that about 600 million years ago. Um, and, and we think what probably happened was we, we begin to get enough oxygen in the atmosphere that all the methane is oxidized, or most of it anyway. And that reduces the greenhouse effect and things just get cold and, and ice and ice over. Um, so yeah. climate, oxygen, life, all closely tied together. The earth is the way it is today, mainly because of life. Yeah. Um, Bill, while you were offline, we, we, we had sort of lost hope. We didn't think we were going to get you back. So we carried on and we're just about to show the, uh, the video of John yeah. Perry yeah. talking about for a while before you guys. Probably yeah. So yeah. What we'll do is we'll show the, the video and then we'll talk a, a little bit about it. And then we may go back. If you've got questions for John about the, you know, some of the ideas about how life first emerged, but um, Gerardo, if you can click, get that. Yeah. Video going, uh, that'd be great. Um, the video is about seven minutes. Simon, so, mean, do we want to play yeah, the yeah. whole thing? Yeah, I think I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Stated clearly presents 
What is the RNA world hypothesis? If you were to go back in time 120 million years, you'd find yourself in a dinosaur world. 500 million years ago was a world of trilobites and other strange sea creatures. 3.4 billion years ago was the world of the first living cells. And if you were to go back further still, scientists suspect that chains of a chemical called RNA, or something similar to RNA, kickstarted this entire beautiful mess that we call life. RNA is thought to have given rise to life for several reasons. Chains of RNA are found abundantly in all living cells today. RNA is a close chemical cousin to DNA. And with very little help from researchers, RNA chains can replicate, evolve, and interact with their environments. While many details have yet to be worked out, the RNA world hypothesis is the simple idea that somewhere on our early planet, perhaps in a tide pool or hot spring, the Earth's chemistry was producing random chains of RNA. Once formed, they began replicating, evolving, and competing with each other for survival. As these chains evolved and diversified, some eventually began cooperating to produce the genetic code, a wide array of complex proteins, and even living cells which, from the perspective of RNA, can actually be thought of as houses or survival machines for RNA to live inside. To understand how RNA chains can interact with their environments, replicate, and evolve, we first need to understand the simple process of base pairing. Chains of RNA are made of nucleotides, small molecules that come in four different types labeled A, C, U, and G. The backbone atoms of a nucleotide, shown here as a yellow bar, can form strong chemical bonds with the backbone atoms of any other RNA nucleotide. This means that different chains can have completely different sequences from left to right. The parts we call the bases of nucleotides, the colored sections labeled A, C, U, or G, are attracted to other bases sort of like a magnet, but they're selective about who they will stick to. G selectively pairs with C, A selectively pairs with U. When bases find their matches and stick together, we call it base pairing. Researchers have found that with a little bit of assistance, base pairing allows chains of RNA to replicate and evolve. Here's how it works. When a long chain of RNA is suspended in cool water with high concentrations of free nucleotides, the chain can act as a template for its own replication. Nucleotides automatically base pair with their partners on the existing chain. If their backbone atoms form chemical bonds with each other, and by the way, this is the part that currently requires assistance from researchers. We're not yet sure how this would have happened in the wild. A complementary RNA strand is born, one with the exact inverse sequence of the original. If the water is then heated, paired bases lose their grip, allowing both chains to act as templates when the cycle repeats. The great thing about this process is that every other RNA chain produced is a copy of the original, but sometimes mutations slip in. This means that as chains compete for survival and reproduction, true evolution, descent with modification, acted upon by selection, can operate on chains of RNA. As amazing as replication is, base pairing also gives RNA chains a second special ability. When placed in water cool enough for base pairing, but without enough free nucleotides for replication, chains will fold up and base pair with themselves. The end result is a complex shape with certain sticky bases pointing outward because they weren't able to find partners. These sticky outward facing bases can cause unique chemical reactions by interacting with other molecules in their environment. A folded chain of RNA capable of guiding a specific chemical reaction is what we call a ribozyme. Some ribozymes break certain molecules apart. Others join certain molecules together. A ribozyme's specific function is determined by its specific shape, and its shape is determined by its sequence. If a mutation changes a ribozyme's sequence, the shape can be modified, and so can its function. When ribozymes were first discovered, scientists wondered how difficult it would be for random chains of RNA to evolve legitimate survival functions. Imagine, for example, a ribozyme that could build nucleotides out of molecules it finds in its environment. Across multiple generations, natural selection could promote and refine this ribozyme because the chain would tend to have access to more free nucleotides than its rivals, allowing it to replicate more often. To explore this idea, researchers at Simon Fraser University produced a large group of random RNA chains 
and examine them to see if any happen to be able to make nucleotides. Surprisingly, some actually could, but they weren't very efficient. Researchers selected out the successful chains and then used a lab technique called PCR to quickly replicate them with slight random mutations. After just 10 rounds of PCR, followed by selection, highly efficient nucleotide-building ribozymes evolved. These are molecules with the lifelike ability to actively participate in their own survival. These ribozymes, and many others produced through similar experiments, are beginning to blur the line between living things and simple chemistry. So to sum things up, the RNA world hypothesis is the simple idea that the first things to replicate and evolve on our planet may have been chains of RNA or something similar to them. While the basic idea of the RNA world does seem to give us a promising pathway to the origin of life, it's still very much a work in progress. As mentioned, one of several unsolved problems is, how did nature get backbone binding to function without the special enzymes or lab techniques we use today? While many researchers continue to focus on RNA, others are investigating alternative molecules, chemical systems that might replicate and evolve without assistance and could have given rise to RNA. Continual breakthroughs are being found in both avenues of research. I'm John Perry, and that's the RNA world hypothesis stated clearly. This video is right. funded by the Center for Chemical Evolution, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. Though we do receive grants from time to time, we don't need to listen to the credits, okay. possible with financial contributions from viewers like you. To support us, <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's uh, Simon, you're muted, but I think you have a question. There we go, Simon. Okay. I'm unmuted now. Yeah. yeah. So it's good to see that you're supported by such um, respectable institutions as NASA. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, that's, that's beautiful. I, um, I, but you do make a very important point. Science has certainly not figured it all out. There's a it's a huge puzzle and we're only getting little bits of pieces of that puzzle being resolved step by yeah. step. Pretty yeah. neat pieces. I mean, the, the things that, uh, that RNA can do is it's spectacular that it's so capable. Um, you had had in your slides, you, you, you listed a couple of papers that are really interesting. Uh, we actually yeah. have found that chains of RNA, when they're evolving, they can actually evolve the ability to cooperate with each other. And this is this just happens automatically. You get these things replicating, you throw problems at them so that it's hard for them to replicate. And because they're this process of Darwinian evolution, it's a very it's 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 very similar to learning. These molecules essentially learn how to deal with the struggles that are that are put in their environments. And there's, we've, we have these experiments now showing that they'll actually end up forming alliances with other types of chains of RNA, other lineages of, of RNA yeah. chains to solve these <laughs> complex problems. It's so interesting that all you have to do yeah. is put a replicator, feed it, you know, what it needs to replicate and it will start evolving and solving actual problems. It's super fascinating. But yeah, without knowing, <laughs> right, right, it has no, has no, without being that. conscious, and that's what the, all, virtually all of evolution is. Is there's no nothing yeah. consciously driving it. It's just su survival of the thing that works, right, the best. Right. Yeah. So it's really interesting how there's that, that you know, in that video you showed the, the capacity to replicate, mm -hmm. and then the capacity, the the, the uh, well, I don't know if you call it capacity, but the fact that every now and then mistakes appear in the sequence, which generates the variation, and then you um, have selection that occurs on it. But yeah, I've um, I pulled out just from the last couple of years some research papers that are pulling that are looking at this all of the different elements that mm -hmm. would be required for this um, for the RNA hypothesis to have occurred. Um, including the fact that, as we've talked about earlier, there's, um, you know, if you create the conditions of the early world, their RNA sort of pops into the into existence. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. I, it it we do get RNA. So we find we find RNA bases. Remember the bases are the parts that pair with each other, 
And then we find yeah. the RNA sugars. We find all of that in meteorites. All of that is there. The catch is that it's in extremely, extremely low concentrations. So the, whatever yeah. the chemical reactions were that were producing those, they were also producing tons of garbage. Well, garbage in our case, because we're interested in RNA. This is yeah. called the tar paradox in origin of life research. Hmm. And so you either need to find a different reaction than the ones we've been studying so far, or you need to find some sort of natural sorting mechanism that pulls RNA out of that, that mess. So there's a, this is what I say when, when I say there's a lot of, it's still very much a work in progress. Um, I, in that video, I talked about R the RNA world hypothesis. I, I said RNA or something similar to RNA. Um, some people in the field, like you'll read papers where they say the RNA world hypothesis is dead or that's been, um, mm. uh, you know, we're, we've moved past it. What they're talking about is they're talking about how that they're not using strict RNA or not RNA only. Uh, so th the way that I've defined the RNA world hypothesis would actually include what, what they're doing. So you'll see like the RNA peptide world hypothesis where you're, you're mixing amino acids with RNA and some other types of molecules. But mm. the it still is, I mean, the basics of the RNA world that, that, that RNA was, or something very similar to it, was the first thing to reach true Darwinian evolution. That is still very much alive, and it, it's a very fruitful field, uh, fruitful line of research right now. Mm. It's, it, to me, it just seems so compelling because... Mm -hmm. Obviously, RNA, DNA, and protein or amino acids are are in every living organism. Right. It's just central. So that, that seems to be obviously a very intuitively a very good place to start. Yeah. Um, Especially, I mean, the we're basing that on modern life, and of course, the first life forms could have been dramatically different and yeah, gave yeah. rise to things like DNA and RNA and, and protein. So there is that problem. So it, it's very good that we, we still do have researchers that are just going on wild goose chases, basically, just yeah. looking at completely different sets of chemistry. But the we can approach this from, from two ways. We, we can approach it from what sorts of chemical reactions happen abundantly in the types of environments that, that uh, Dr. White was talking about. So that's like the, you know, the, the ground up way to look at the origin of life. The other way is to look at modern cells today and try and simplify them as much as possible and see if we can get those two those, those two sides to reach each other in the middle and actually mm. get a model that works start to finish completely in a prebiotically plausible scenario. And that's, that's really what we're looking for. Mm. Now, probably many, many, many years away from figuring that out, I'd yeah. imagine. Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I should say that you've got a, you've got a couple of other YouTube clips, I think, that deal with the um, metabolism and yeah. a few other RNA videos that folks can encourage them to go to your website, state it clearly to, to have a look at those. But let's move on now to um, Bill, unless you have any more comments or questions for John. Let's yeah. talk about what we do actually know for certain about life and that is when the first life appeared well the first clear evidence of life on the earth and that's i think okay uh, yeah the, the the first evidence of life is not really fossils at all but rather it's let's call it isotopically light carbon found in sedimentary rocks that are roughly 3.7 to 3.8 billion years old in Greenland. These are these oldest sediments and they, and, and, and they have this signature of life uh, of isotopically light carbon. Maybe you can throw up the slide on uh, carbon isotopes and uh, I can talk a bit it's about a bit that. further down, uh, Gerardo, oh. it's... Slide 37. There's, there's basically two versions of, of, of two stable versions of the carbon atom 
Uh, both have six proteins, uh, protons, but one has seven neutrons. The other has, uh, the other has, uh, has six. It turns out that the, the heavier carbon, the one with the seven neutrons, uh, forms stronger bonds. And so when photosynthesis happens, that it's the carbon 12, the light version, that tends to be the, the bond between carbon and oxygen and CO2 is easier to break. So that's what life does. I like to think about this as trees are lazy. They have a choice between, you know, making organic mar uh, 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 molecules out of carbon 12. That's easy because the bonds are weak or make it out of carbon 13. That's harder because the bonds are stronger. So obviously they do the easy job. Well, it turns out this carbon in these 3.8 billion years old is about two, two and a half percent richer in carbon 12 than typical carbon. And the okay. only way we can figure this out, the, the only good explanation for it, the only way anybody's convincingly explained it is because it was produced by, by life, either chemosynthesis or photosynthesis. Um, so that and and that that discovery was made 25 years ago or so, and it's been mm -hmm. debated. But it, and nobody's come up with a better idea than than life. I mean, there's you know alternative ideas, just have not. Nobody's been able to knock down the idea that this was life. Yeah. And so these you, obviously weren't trees. These were the very very earliest organisms that could photosynthesize. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. There. They're unicellular, probably something vaguely familiar to cyanobacteria, whether they're even that advanced, we don't know, but they were they were doing yeah. photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. They were making organic yeah. matter out of CO2, okay, which is the basic thing that life does. Uh, you know, yeah. plant life does, and without plant life, the rest of us would starve. Right? So uh, and then so fast that's, that's fascinating because I've always thought, you know, the um, I haven't really thought about isotopes being being able to use isotopes to determine the earliest forms of life. I, you know, we always just tend to think about fossils, um, but you're saying that the so, so I guess one question I have is: there's carbon twelve and carbon thirteen. They're both stable forms of carbon. Yes, are they? Is it does their the proportion like it's like ninety nine percent is carbon twelve and one percent is carbon thirteen? Is is that ratio in go right back to in the stars when the carbon is formed, and then they're just stable from then on? Fixed by, but it does vary. You know, we can actually measure this ratio in in stars approximately uh, spectroscopically, yeah. and different stars have different ratios. But this ratio is about the same within a few percent in our solar system. Okay. It does okay. very much yeah. way that, that organic matter in Murchison, that's heavy. It's about 4% richer in carbon-13. So you know that wasn't made by life. I mean, or at least that would not be consistent with being made by life. But, yeah, within a because, okay. because of these so-called fractionations, because they're chemically slightly different, you know, there's several percent variation in the in our solar system. You go to other stars, and there's bigger variations depending on the nucleosynthetic processes that are the, the nuclear reactions going on in stars. But yeah, it's pretty much fixed by what's okay. happening in stars. And carbon, yeah. you you carbon fourteen uh, is radioactive. That's created by cosmic rays in the atmosphere. That's that's a, that's it, quite it, different. That's quite different. And you know, it's a half life. Yeah. 6,000 years, that carbon-14 is not relevant to this, this discussion. Yeah, yeah. So carbon-13 is not ra radioactive. In the, it's not decaying to anything. It's a very stable right. molecule oh, of carbon. Yeah. Stable, yes. Yeah. Oh, cool. Because, I mean, it's, it's almost, well, it makes sense that there was life on the Earth 3.9 billion years ago because... It's not long and much later, like 3.5 billion years ago, that we have very widely accepted evidence of life, and that's in the fossils. And I think they're in 
Western Australia in um, the Pilbara, I think. Yes. That would be, I think, yeah, where those earliest. So all pretty, pretty much all the scientific community agrees that these are life forms. I've, I've read, I did a bit of reading, and they've actually drilled into the fossils and been able to extract carbon from that layer mm -hmm. where, which has been laid down. And uh, and I, I suspect they probably looked at the carbon-12, carbon-13 ratios of those. Yeah. Have they, Bill? I don't know. They're, by the way, stromatolites, we have modern analogies of them. They're, they're very distinctive in their wavy form. And, and yeah. this also is quite light carbon in them. It's like 3% lighter than them. That we have in the oceans. That's a, a that's a dead giveaway, but this mm -hmm. has been produced by um, photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, probably photosynthesis. These stromatolites build up in very shallow water bays like Shark Bay in Western Australia. Uh, they're built yeah. by cyanobacteria, which are people also call them blue green algae. They're not algae; they're bacteria, but they do photosynthesis. And the modern ones are produced by the cyanobacteria. Mm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we don't we don't know that the uh, original ones or the, the old you know multi billion year old ones were doing photosynthesis, but it's... no, we, we don't know that um, they were doing photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, three point five. We uh, it might have been whiffs of oxygen, but it's still pretty much not much oxygen in the atmosphere back then. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really interesting to so, note that even even that far back in time, living organisms had to deal with their neighbors and they were likely evolving to cope with each other and probably evolving forms of cooperation. So very, very long long ago. But we didn't get multi-celled animals for billions of years later. <laughs> so it's yeah. It, it was it was yeah, Gerardo, if you, you could go back to that slide that we looked at previously, the geological, we can talk talk about some of the events. So it's 31. <clears throat> 31. What's the title, Simon? Geological What's... Evidence of Life on Earth. That one. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're studying. So we've been talking about the isotopic evidence, which um, 3.9 billion years ago. Yeah. Um, earlier, uh, you talked a little bit about the rise in oxygen levels bill um and that seems to have occurred because of cyanobacteria is that right yes, yes. and they, they, yeah so true algae does as slide shows they don't come along till about 1.7 billion years that's the earliest um so-called yeah. uh, so so uh, one distinction between bacteria and you and i we're eukaryotes they're prokaryotes we actually have a nucleus with the nuclear matter inside uh, a, a membrane. Uh, bacteria don't. Um, so up until, you know, about 2 billion years, 1.7 billion years ago, the world's totally dominated by bacteria and their cousins, the archaea. Uh, but there are bacteria that do photosynthesis and there are ones that do chemosynthesis. Uh, and, and so those are really the ones that produced uh, the first oxygen in the atmosphere. It was, it, was, it was a bacterial world. And even these, you know, we get to 1.7, yeah. we're still talking about mostly unicellular organisms. Oh, the other thing I should say is, that, well, in, yeah, show another slide is, so there's this pulse of oxygen around, um, of, um, around 2.4 billion years ago, but um, not enough to support you and I. So we're still talking about lower amounts of oxygen than in the, mo in the modern world. Um, and <laughs> modern amounts of oxygen don't come along until forests come along, which is much longer down the road. Yeah. All right, I'm, uh, I'm keen to hear you talk about tectonic, plate tectonics, Bill, because I think you've done a an awful lot of research in that field. Um, I was reading that it, the the emergence of plate tectonics had a quite a significant influence on the evolution of life on the Earth because it created. Is it true that it created a lot more niches for evolution to occur when you started getting the separation of the continents? 
Yes, well, um, so, so there's, there's, first of all, there's, a, there's no debate about whether plate tectonics happens in the earth, and we understand how and why it happens. There's a lot of debate about when it began, actually, interestingly. Um, so some people think it began, you know, almost right away, four, four and a half billion years ago. Other things, maybe not till two and a half billion years ago. Um, maybe there was some sort of other convection. Hey, plate tectonics is a result of convection in the Earth's interior, uh, and that is a result of the Earth trying to lose its heat. Hot inside, hot material rises up, cold material uh, sinks down. This drives the, the movement of plates. Maybe there was some other convective style early in the Earth. The really important thing about plate tectonics, and early on in Earth's history, uh, when there's only um, microscopic life, is it provides nutrients, okay, particularly phosphorus. You need to have erosion. Uh, you need to have weathering and erosion that delivers things like phosphorus to the ocean where life is or wherever else it was. It was in these pools as well. Um, and, you know, and in order to have erosion, you need to have uplift. And the way most uplift works today is by plates colliding together and, you know, Things get pushed up, or by yeah. volcanism, which builds uh, high mountains. Then they get eroded down by, by water. Yeah. Phosphorus and other nutrients, including, for example, iron, all the other things that life needs, get washed into the ocean uh, yeah. that supports life. Once you flatten out the surface of the earth and you don't have any erosion anymore, the, the organisms in the ocean use up all the, the nutrients. All falls to the bottom, gets buried in sediment. You don't have any life anymore. So you got to have yeah. tectonic activity to have to continue to have life. Oh, and we think too, I should say, that uh, this may have played a particularly important role in when we get these increases in atmospheric oxygen. We think that was somehow related to plate tectonics and feeding a lot of phosphorus into the ocean. Allowing a lot of uh, a lot of photosynthesis, and and uh, and a lot of production of oxygen. So so, plate tectonics in that sense plays into that important role. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, you know, is how much shallow ocean you have, uh, as opposed to deep ocean. Shallow ocean provides uh, niches for organisms that want to uh, attach themselves to the the, to the bottom, but yet be uh, have sunlight. Uh, so yes, in, in the sense of creating niches, and if you get too much shallow ocean, in some cases, maybe you can have uh, too much photosynthesis. One of the ideas about, about climate crises, you get too much photosynthesis, uh, you create a lot of oxygen, but you pull all the CO2 out of the air, not all of it, a lot of it, mm. and you don't have a greenhouse effect and things freeze over. We do actually have a slide that shows, that illustrates tech, plate tectonic. Um, just two, yeah, have you got that one? That one? The next slide. The next slide. Okay. It shows the sort of, how it sort of happens. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you talked a little bit about this, but um, um, can you sort of just describe the major driving force there of, of plate tectonics, Bill? Okay, so this, this illustrates uh, a, an ocean plate uh, being pushed down under a continental plate. And this happens because the ocean plate is basically denser. It's made of denser rock and forms at mid-ocean ridges, uh, but then it cools and it cools. It's relatively dense rock and eventually gets so dense that it just sinks back into the mantle because it's cold. Um, and as it's pushed down, uh, what happens is that, uh, oh, the other thing that happens to this ocean crust is it reacts with water and you form these water-bearing minerals. As it's pushed down, as it subducts into the, uh, into the mantle, um, the pressure causes these water-bearing minerals to, uh, uh, to break down, release their water. That water then migrates 
into what we call a mantle wedge, the region in the overlying plate. Um, and one thing, if you have hot rock, you have rock hot enough, if you add water to it, it'll melt. So adding water to that hot rock uh, in the overlying plate causes it to melt, and that's what causes these volcanic island arcs like, um, uh, you know, Tonga and uh, the Aleutians and uh, um, South America, and the Caribbean, uh, is, that, is that water being added uh, in the mantle beneath is, is causing that rock to melt and producing, uh, uh, producing these volcanoes. Okay. I have some good friends who live in Hawaii, and shout out to Ryan and Elaine. I'm really fascinated to hear you talk about uh, is is Hawaii sort of the same sort of thing going on there? Is nope. a uh, what's what's driving the formation of the Hawaiian Islands? Okay, well this is yeah this is where that sort of thing is actually where it, I think it's different, thing. isn't it? Yeah, um, it is different. Okay, so Hawaii is, I think you had a slide you might want to bring up. Hawaii is a product of what we call a mantle plume. So and this, the next slide uh, illustrates the mantle plume. This is straight off my phone. Okay, so anyone that's listening who's interested can go into Google Earth or Google Maps, zoom in on Hawaii, select the satellite view, and you'll be able to see what we're talking about. Uh, that's a copy straight off the Google Maps. Yeah, and what's relevant here is a chain of volcanoes, okay? And the active ones are all in the southeast end. As you go to the, to the north and west, the volcanoes get older. Eventually, they sink beneath the sea, and we've only got um, seamounts left. You, you can ask, why do they sink beneath the sea? Well, first of all, they get eroded. But second of all, they cool and they contract. Okay, so they're actually are slowly but surely sinking uh, because they're contracting. Um, but so this idea, so how do you form these chains of volcanoes? It turns out that direction from the youngest volcanoes, the old dead ones, is the direction the, the Pacific plate is moving. So the first idea was it's moving over a hot spot and uh, and then the question is, why is there a hot spot there? It's a melting spot. The plate is moving over a melting spot. Well, how do you get, you got a convecting mantle. How do you get a stationary melting spot? Um, that's where this idea of a mantle plume came along. We have a column of hot rock rising and we eventually, and now we, it's pretty clear, we can image these things seismically. They're rising from the base of the mantle all the way down to the core mantle boundary, which is about 300 kilometers, 3,000 kilometers. Um, so uh, there's, there's this column of rock. It's probably 100 kilometers wide. It's solid all the way. It's not liquid. It's, so this is solid state convection. It's solid. It's rising because it's hot. It gets to within 100, 200 kilometers of the surface and starts to melt, producing volcanoes. Um, so when, when I was a graduate student, this idea was new and highly controversial. Um, in the last decade now, as I said, we've been able to actually image seismically these hot columns of rock that, that, that are these mantle plumes. And uh, they explain a whole bunch of uh, different um, uh, uh, observations, among other things that I'm involved in, is that uh, some of what my work's been is these these uh, they're quite dis distinctive in their in their compositions. These these plume metal plume related volcanoes, quite distinctive in their compositions, quite distinctive in their um, in their isotopic uh, compositions, and sort of what my contribution was. Uh, on this was to sort of figure out that they're distinctive because they contain stuff that was once at the surface of the earth and subducted all the way to the back to the bottom of the mantle is coming back up in these in these uh, in these mantle plumes. That was a highly controversial idea as yeah. well. Um, so you're but, saying you're a fairly controversial scientist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've, 
in the mean, I mean, yeah. So that was I, I wrote a paper in 1982 about that, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, it wasn't. Well, it's was just you know one more crazy idea, uh, but it's turned out over the past you know four decades or so, and it's mm. just absolute clear evidence, mostly coming from isotopes, that places like Hawaii, yeah. that, that rock that's melting has been way into the deep mantle, but it has stuff that was once at the surface of the earth. Can I ask a question about that image of um, Hawaii there? It looks like there's a, there's a clear line going up to the left and then it a kink and it goes north. Is that where the continental plates have sort of the directions shifted slightly? Is that what's going on there? Clear line, I, I, can't, I can't see it all that well. But that clear line is the Emperor Seamount chain. Okay, so that, that chain of volcanoes goes well beyond. Yes, okay, yeah, I can see it. Well beyond, up into that, that corner, um, the kink yeah. where the Aleutians end and Kamchatka begins. And that's making a can. Those are subduction zones. That's where the Pacific Plate is going down. That kink is there. Okay. Yeah. The, the man, the the Hawaiian mantle plume is can, is creating thicker crust that doesn't want to go down. Okay. So so yeah. it's just putting an indentation in the subduction zone where the uh, where the Pacific Plate is sinking. Uh, down into the uh, back into the mantle, and, yeah. Yeah. So the first on chain, right? That's that's what that is. So that that and that's like, uh, ooh, it's a good sixty million years. Is it even older? The oldest volcanoes on that chain. So that plume's been there, stationary more or less, uh, for that long. Yeah. For the, how is that? How long is that? Is that hundreds of millions of years or? Well, we don't know when the Hawaiian plume started um, because yeah. you know, the chain ends up in a subduction zone. Uh, but I think the oldest uh, volcanoes there right up uh, in the corner are 60 million years old. Um, we have another chain in the Indian Ocean where the active volcano is Reunion, which is like Kilauea, one of the more active volcanoes on the planet. Uh, yeah. We can trace that back <coughs> also to to about 65 million years ago to uh, what's called a flood basalt or, or, or plateau basalt in India, uh, the Deccan flood basalt, where an enormous amount of, I mean, there's this huge pile of, of, of volcanic rock, enormous amounts of basalt flow, flow down. Yeah. I think that was the starting point for this, for that particular reunion mantle plume. So we think these things start with the, you can sort of imagine big bulbous head uh, that, that it needs to have the, the buoyancy to fight its way up through the mantle and then followed by a more or less thin column. So Hawaii is the thin column. Reunion yeah. is the can volcanism of a thin column. But the Deccan trap 65 million years ago uh, would have been this big bulbous head getting to the surface and producing this enormous pulse of volcanism. Yeah. And there's other examples uh, of that too. Yeah. I, at this point, I might just sort of interrupt that to talk about, go back and talk about some doctrine that's actually some beliefs that are quite widely held in the church. Um, and that is that the continents were um, only became divided after the flood. Um, and these are references, these are scriptural references that are taken from the, the earliest website. Um, the Doctrine of Covenants that says that the earth shall be, so this is at the second coming of Christ, that the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided. And there's a footnote there on the word divided, which takes the reader to Genesis, where it talks about the days of Peleg, where it, this is, I think he's the grandson of um, Noah. So it was in the days of Peleg when the, the earth was divided. So there's actually quite a, a, a widespread belief amongst Mormons that the the, uh, the um, continental drift did take place, but it took place very rapidly after the flood. Um, but uh, I guess, uh, Bill, you'd have a hard time believing that that sort of took place in all, yes. all that. 
yes. continental roof you're talking about took place in the last four and a half thousand years. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, the, the last time all the continents were together, they've been, you know, we've had what we call supercontinent episodes every once in a while. It's sort of like scum on the surface of the ocean all gets pushed, you know, together, or surface of a lake or a pond gets pushed together in one place. Yeah. Um, so the last time that happened was Pangaea, uh, what we the supercontinent we call Pangaea. That was uh, just about uh, 250 million years ago. Um, and there were supercontinents yeah. before then. But so I don't, you know, that's, uh, that's long before there were humans around the last time the, uh, the continents yeah. were all more or, less, more or less together. And, you know, they're, now they're drifting apart. How fast? Man, centimeters per year, right? Yeah. So the, the off-stated analogy, about as fast as your fingernails grow. Um, yeah. So We actually talked there. about this in an earlier episode, and some of the clearest evidence is the fact that, um, like Australia is moving north fast, northeast fast enough that if they didn't update the GPS, we'd still, we'd find out, we're driving ourselves in the next two decades, we'd find ourselves in the... And they're almost in the next lane. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's just uh, such compelling evidence that these things are happening at such yeah, a snail pace. Yeah, I guess you got to, um, yeah, I guess you think you've got to say uh, it speeds up to 10 centimeters a year. You know, after yeah. 10 years, uh, you know, that's uh, that's 100 that's centimeters. That's, that's, a, that's meter. a meter. Yeah. You're off the road if you're on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're I've driven over the over the range from Yosemite to I can't remember the name of the town over, but I've driven over the range, and that's one of the narrowest roads I've ever been on. And I've seen been behind Winnebago's that have only got twenty centimeters on either side of the the yeah. vehicle. And and uh, yeah, if you didn't adjust GPS, um, you'd be yeah. yeah we did. So we've gone we're... a little bit longer. Sorry, we've we've gone a little bit longer than I. <laughs> It's yeah, been absolutely fascinating. It's been wonderful to have you here, uh, Bill and John. But I thought we'd just finish off by sort of coming back to slide um, 40. I think slide uh, 40, and we'll just sort of quickly run through. And okay, uh, I think it's fair to say, you know, given that we have um, very many respected uh, who now are distancing themselves from the claims that the church has made in the, the book of Abraham. Um, I think it's f fair enough to refer to um, the things that Joseph Smith was um, including in the Book of Abraham as guesses when it comes to um, the cosmos. Um, but when you guess, you get some things right. And uh, I think one of those is if we run through these world without number, um, yep. would it be fair to say, Bill, that there could be well and true, well and truly, be worlds without number. I yeah, think we're no, in... yeah. I mean, um, sure. Um, <laughs> in terms of just plain planets, uh, you know, we already know about thousands of them. Uh, yeah. In terms of planets with life, well, we don't know of any specifically, but you know, we we have some candidates, and we've only examined a very, 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 very small fraction of the stars in our neighborhood. So if you yeah, explain yeah. that, yeah, there's worlds without. So it's basically technology has been the limitation there. But when it seems like all of, I mean, they're talking now about getting radio telescopes on the on the moon, so they can ex, expand, you know, join up with the ones on the Earth to get even greater power. So it's it's going to be amazing to see what they come up with in the next few decades. The next generation is the Spitzer, uh, not Spitzer, the um, the Webb telescope, which is out there. And it's an infrared telescope, and it's still cooling. Um, it, you know, it needs to be really cold to work. And so I think they're talking about August when it really uh, starts to work. Okay. These, the, the, the telescope is designed to image, first of all, the most distant galaxies, uh, which are no longer in the visible part of the spectrum. They're in the infrared part of the spectrum. And also the yeah. planets which are going to be in the infrared part of the spectrum. So we're going to learn a lot more about planets uh, when the Webb telescope is up and running. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay, the next one, sun created after the Earth. Uh, I'm going to put a big nope on that one. 
um, the sun was formed before the earth or around yep. about the same time. You know, what's a few million years? But I've, yeah, um, Earth revolves around the sun. I think that's a I think that's a direct hit, but um, I think it's fairly obvious that um, it was probably right. common knowledge. I think by the time of Joseph Smith, that um, many many scientists believed that the Earth revolved around the sun. Um, I think that be fair. Uh, uh, Copernicus's ideas would have been fairly widely accepted by then. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. All right. But I think uh, he certainly got a direct hit with matter is eternal. I think we can give him that one. Um, in terms of sun receiving light from Kolob, I'm going to say nope. I don't think that's correct. I think it's uh, pretty well established that the light derived from the Earth is uh, from nuclear fusion. It's um, hydrogen fusing into helium. Would that be right? Bill? Yes, absolutely. The Earth's make the sun is making its own light. Yeah. yeah. So have we been reasonably fair there, John? <laughs> yeah, I'd say have. I'd say that works. Yeah. <laughs> John D, I think we're I think we're done. All right. Well, Bill White and John it's Perry. Fantastic to have Bill and John on. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fun. You do Mormon stories a real honor to to join us for this uh, episode of Bill and John, and uh, I hope we can uh, learn more from you both in the future. Great, yeah. yeah. And and John John uh, has Perry has to he said he's happy to come on and do a whole episode on his his story. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be fun. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was like, you know, I was a missionary in Brazil. Yeah, all that. <laughs> so, John, we'd love to. John, let, we'd love to have you on to tell your story. That'd be amazing, and to promote cool. your amazing work. Oh, cool! Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just give me a heads up. And, okay. Right. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll make sure and in, include a link to your YouTube channel yes. in our in our show notes. Great. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, sorry, Bill, about losing you for a little bit there, but um, you can always go back and watch the YouTube clip and and listen to to John. My my phone plugged in. <laughs> Came back up. Okay, always a pleasure to talk about science. Thanks, Bill. No, it was wonderful. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yep, Bill. Okay. See you guys. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. Simon. Thanks, John. And thanks. thanks. John. Thanks to everyone for joining us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. We appreciate your support. We appreciate Simon for organizing this panel and Gerardo for helping Simon out. We appreciate all of you who tune in. Please give us your feedback on today's episode. We'd love to hear it. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com or you can comment in the uh, on the YouTube channel, on the Facebook channel. We take your comments seriously. We value it and it will help shape uh, future episodes and future content. Uh, you guys be good to each other, be kind to each other, and uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.